Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Mesa City Council study session for the morning of April the 14th. Uh, all of our pre council are present with the exception of Mr. Luna, who is traveling today and is excused. The first item on our agenda is to review our agenda for our Monday meeting on April 18th. So please take a look at that document and let us uh, know if you have any questions or would, uh, would like any additional information on any item on that agenda. Mr. Brady, anything that staff would like to... Uh, just, I would like to highlight that we have four or five items on here where we're buying uh, equipment from Empire. So it's worth, um, I think the value is over $900,000. So be able to support a local company in Mesa. So we're okay. pleased about that. That is good. Lots of thank you to Empire for lots of good jobs in Mesa. Yep. Mr. Thompson. Marilyn, item 8A, I will need to recuse myself from that um, because of my client. So I will uh, have to have that pulled from <coughs> consent. Okay. 8A will be pulled, and Mr. Thompson's declared a conflict on that. Vice Mayor. Item, just a minute, I just had a, is it 7A, or did, sometimes when I bookmark it, it changes later. But it's, is it the 32nd Street? Project still on? No. no. Oh, sorry. That might have been an older. Okay, then maybe that was an older version and it got updated. Okay, so I don't have a question on that since it's no longer on there. Um, I noticed in 5N, and let me make sure it's still on 5N from when I looked at it, there was a grant, yeah, for the Mesa Electric Utility Summer Indoor Health and Safety Program. I'm excited about that, and if there was someone just to explain a little bit more about what that is, it's great. If not, kudos Thanks. for having these ways to escape the heat. I'm sure they were hoping you would ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Mayor and Vice Mayor. Frank McRae with the Energy Resources Department. So what this application does is it um, targets our low-income customers who uh, have challenges replacing their older inefficient air conditioners. They can create all kinds of issues for them. It creates indoor air quality because they're not filtering and, and um, processing the air efficiently or effectively within the household. It's a very inefficient air conditioner that's prone to breakage, prone to breaking down. So this program starts a program that we hope to expand in the future with other grant monies where we're targeting low-income customers. They're typically not the owner of the building. And so the landlord doesn't pay the electric bill, so they don't have the motivation to replace the air conditioner. It's a renter, so they're probably not having the motivation to invest the money it takes to replace the air conditioner. So this program kicks off that as kind of a pilot, if you will, so that we can start expanding this program in the future with other um, funding sources. And Mayor and Council, we probably it would also be good to recognize that there are several items on this agenda where we're receiving the pass-through grants from our um, <clears throat> Native American communities, and really appreciate their willingness to support, whether it's directly to city programs like this or other groups that are in the city of Mesa that are also benefiting um, from the dollars that they are receiving. Yeah. So we appreciate uh, their support, and there are several items I think Council can see in the agenda related to those grants. So Frank, um, how does the program work? Does some do residents apply for that if they're aware their air conditioner is not performing and they need? Yeah, it, um, Tony Cadoran is leading the effort on this program, so I'm going to have to go from a little bit of a, a challenge memory. But we will be um, collaborating with a local nonprofit firm that will help identify the customers, expand it. With the amount of money that we're talking about, I think we're talking less than 20 customers initially. Mm -hmm. So I think based upon our historical communications with customers about their bills and about these issues, as well as um, certain parts of the city, we, we will have a good idea of where to approach the customers if they're not approaching us for this program. So is it replacing or just repairing the units? In, in some instances, it may be a repair if that's the most effective way. But I anticipate that most of the customers will end up with a, a new air conditioner. Great. Thank you. Mr. Brady, so did, just so I understand what you said, that when I was reviewed this, uh, the agenda, I seemed like there were multiple grants from multiple uh, Indian tribes 
And these, I, I was under the impression these are applications, but these are actual awards. Sharon, will you help clarify that for me, please? Because that's. Uh, so maybe this is the application that has to have an endorsement from the city council. Yeah, Mayor and City Council, uh, these are actually the applications to the tribes. This is City Council's opportunity to support applications by the local organizations to the tribes for this funding. It is up to the tribes then to determine which uh, organizations will receive those awards, and then it allows the city manager to then accept and pass through those awards without having to come back to council at a later date, and that will be more efficient on the back end. And Sharon, but the application to apply for an application is not, is it somewhat of an invitation also to do the application? Not for these tribes. Okay, these, these are different? Okay. For these particular tribes, it's not by invitation. That would be a different process. But okay. for these particular tribes, it is done simply uh, based on City Council's prior guidance to me as the grants coordinator of City of Mesa to uh, provide the support the resolutions to you to support these organizations. And so it's based on criteria that was pri uh, set previously for us to pass through. And then it's up to the tribes to de decide who they want to award the funding to. And we can certainly follow up once we know which awards were made and share that with the council. And council will always get a report from me uh, in, the, in the aftermath, if you will, for me, uh, that reflects who was awarded and which projects are moving forward? Well, they're all very worthy uh, causes, so we, we, anything we can do to support that, I'm anxious to do that and look forward to hopefully getting some good news later. Thank you for your work on that. Uh, Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. We're going to have a, I know we have a presentation on general obligation bonds, but just to know that we're having a resolution being talked about on Mondays. And so I look forward to the uh, discussion on our bonds. Thank you. And I know part of it was issuing bonds to pay off uh, more expensive bonds, right? So I, I, mm -hmm. I know we, we love to do that and we love to, to get a number on we just saved X millions of dollars. So at some point, uh, is this contingent yeah, on? We don't know yet. Well, in the, in the, market, in the world today, the environment of rising interest rates, that's becoming... Yeah. Which, and not as not probably as significant as it's been in the past, but certainly there's some opportunities. Yes, yeah. so we'll talk about that. Okay, I think after we go to the agenda. Got it. Great, Council. Any other uh, questions about Monday's agenda? All right. Thank you. Next item then is item two A. It's a we'll pick up with our budget discussions. Item two A is a presentation on the city's 2022 capital financing plan. Ryan, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council, good to be here with you today. I'm Ryan Wimmer, uh, City Treasurer, and I'm here to talk today about the 2022 Capital Financing Plan for the city. <clears throat> uh, I just want to note, in addition to city staff that's here, uh, to answer any questions that you have. Our city's financial advisor, Janelle Gold, uh, from Hilltop Securities is here, as well as on the phone or um, online, we have the city's bond attorney, uh, Zach Sakis, with uh, the firm Greenberg Taurig. So they'll, they're available for uh, questions. They help us a lot during these financings as, as really specialists and experts in, in this process. So why is there a need for capital financing? Um, the first item is is to uh, infrastructure to support new development. You look at all the development that's going on in the city right now, um, and it's uh, it needs infrastructure to support it. It's also uh, important that we update existing aging infrastructure uh, through in the older parts of the city. Um, it provides quality of life, uh, public safety facilities, parks, libraries, streets, and utilities. Uh, it's from a process process perspective. It's the funding source for um, the capital improvement program. You're going to hear more about that uh, after me today. And uh, it's also it's equitable or fair because as the infrastructure is being used, it's being paid for. And those who are using it, those who are benefiting from it, are, are paying for it. <clears throat> the process for financing municipal uh, debt is, is similar to 
most loans. The city first borrows money uh, by selling debt to investors, and then uh, that money is used to construct uh, city infrastructure projects. And then lastly, the city pays back uh, that principal, the amount borrowed, with interest for the life of the debt. And that, that payment of principal and interest to the investors is called debt service. The city uh, issues debt with payments for up to 25 years. Um, and typically in municipal debt, you have an option to pay off or call, uh, pay off early or call the debt after 10 years. So it's not like a standard home mortgage where you can refinance at any time. You can only refinance municipal debt typically after 10 years. So there's a lockout period, they call it, uh, before you can refinance that debt. So the, the new debt service that we issue each year is coordinated with the debt service we already have to, to make sure that our payments don't jump around, that they're stable. And <clears throat> the city's financial forecast includes debt service for the current debt, but also future issuances. We assume in the general fund forecast and in the utility fund forecast that you've seen that we're issuing debt every year, every year going forward. And so what's our process in Mesa? Every year we look for, um, we look at selling new debt, we look at refinancing, or it's, it's called refunding, so I'll call it that um, in the presentation, but it's refinancing existing debt at lower interest rates, like Councilmember Freeman was just, um, and the mayor were just referring to. And so same time frame, just lower uh, costs, just like refinancing a mortgage, a home mortgage. And uh, we also look at using cash that we've accumulated to, to fees or pay off uh, existing debt like we did with the spring training uh, debt, stadium debt. Um, and lastly, we pay off bonds that um, are coming due from prior issuances. Every year we have debt from our previous issuances that we're paying off. So this year, uh, we, we haven't talked about this before, but we need to talk about it this year, and that's the difference between tax exempt and taxable city debt. So. Typically, most of our debt is tax exempt. Um, so the federal government does not tax an investor who buys our bonds uh, if they're used for a public purpose. So it's, it's a, really a, a tax break for the city because we don't have to, well, um, if you look at the second bullet, because that in interest income is tax exempt, investors are willing to earn a lower rate on that, a lower interest rate on that, um, on that bond, on that debt. And so the city pays a lower interest rate. So really that tax exemption on public purpose city debt, it, it really benefits the city as much as anyone because the investors earn less, uh, the city pays less. Um, but there, uh, the IRS does not allow tax exempt debt in every case. And so uh, down below or uh, taxable, in that taxable section, it says municipal debt that substantially supports a specific commercial purpose is not eligible to be tax exempt. Um, so there's some debt if it supports a, a specific business uh, can't be tax exempt. And if, it's, if that debt is taxable, then investors uh, require and the city pays a, a, a slightly higher interest rate because it's not tax exempt. And we have the, the case this year that there are a couple of uh, natural gas projects and they're shown here on the map that are substantially supporting a uh, commercial uh, purpose, and that is the CMC steel expansion in Southeast Mesa. And you can see these projects are the, um, the Queen Creek Road gate station and gas line extension uh, down there on the bottom of the map with that, the gate stations on the uh, west, and then uh, that red line across the bottom, that's the, ex the line extension. And then the Meridian Road gas line extension project takes that <clears throat> line up to CMC Steel. So those, these projects, since uh, they do support that expansion to, to a certain degree, we, uh, we're proposing to issue taxable debt to finance these two projects. Right. Let's be uh, clear. I mean, we would, it'd be our preference to have to issue tax exempt bonds, but because our, and our financial advisors have suggested that because this is directly benefiting specifically in, in the volumes, a private enterprise in Mesa that we will be having to issue. We won't be able to qualify under the tax exempt bond. Is that correct? Yes, Mayor Chris, that's, that's exactly right. The IRS has certain thresholds and um, if we'd like, we could hear from our bond attorney about 
the kind of complicated triggers that uh, determine whether something is not tax exempt, but that's the case, yeah. And then in this case, Mayor Council, and I think maybe Frank and Tony can talk a little bit more about it during their presentation, but um, while we're having to extend this line to this location, there is a service agreement, I'm not sure what the right term is, um, that provides for them to pay it back um, over time. So I just want to be clear about that, because yeah, otherwise, yeah, we, we don't typically um, provide that, but we do have um, a reimbursement purchase, agreement. Is purchase that agreement. Fair, fair for this, but we will still have to, up on the front end, the city will still have to issue taxable bonds. It's just a little unusual for us, but again, even the premium on the tax taxable bonds will be part of the cost recovery that we get from the client also, from the user. So we'll be made whole. It's just that at, on the front end, we will have to, we will do the project, we'll issue the bonds, and then we get reimbursed um, through payments over a period of five to seven years. Five to seven years so. so Ryan, while we're on the subject, Overall, our capital improvements in the utilities, since it's an enterprise, we sell water and gas and electric. So are those bond debts, are those taxable or non-taxable? No, they're, the majority is, it, the reason we're bringing this up is quite an exception for us. Rarely do we have okay. to issue tax, taxable bonds for util, well, for any city purpose, I guess I should say, but specifically in this area. But just because of the nature, you can see that we're having to bring a extensive line to get to a one uh, one um, user. That it, the the criteria that was looked at by the financial advisor suggested that it had it wouldn't qualify for tax exempt. Now, at the end of the day, that a premium I call it premium that additional cost for being taxable will be passed on to the user and they'll re, uh, will re, will get reimbursed for, for that cost. But on the front end, when the council sees, what we're telling you is we're going to be issuing bonds and you're going to hear the word taxable on that. And, and that's just what we're trying to explain and share that with you today. Especially when we're being reimbursed is certainly... <laughs> yeah. So we'll be reimbursed. It's, it's unusual. You typically this... Well, and it is, but I don't want to suggest and it's not. It is the cost of the user uh, to you know, be responsible financially for this extension. Um, our kind of incentive to land this significant economic development um, project was that we would finance that cost and but it would get reimbursed. Now on the back side of that, where Frank and Tony are excited about, you also hook up a very large user. So that also helps the enterprise in the long term by selling a lot of gas. So, so I understand for clarification, so our cost recovery on these taxable bonds yeah. will pay for our principal and interest through the course of uh, five to seven years. Five to seven years. So basically, we'll, five to seven years other than covering those costs, will be at a zero balance and paid off. Well, no. We'll so, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Freeman, um, I believe the bonds are um, about. <clears throat> we, we structured the taxable debt to mature first um, for various reasons, but uh, it, it, I think it's outstanding for eight or ten years um, in, in the structure. But we'll have recovered the cost to pay that. that in less than ten yeah, years. Yeah, we won't right. we won't defeat the bonds in five to seven years, but we'll recover Because enough you have cost. the ten-year Yeah, we'll recover enough costs to for... cover that over the full period. Yeah. Okay, just wanted to yeah. understand a little yeah. better. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Councilmember, from yeah, we didn't really try to match that up. We just tried to make sure we recovered the costs that were going to occur. And, and I would say just about these projects that they they don't just serve the CMC steel site. They serve you can see the neighborhood to the south, and there's uh, they they um, they do serve other uh, areas. It's just the the uh, because they are such a large user, the IRS regulations are pretty strict about how what ratio of, of um, a project can support a certain business. So it's not just CMC still being supported. And I believe these lines were going to be built anyway, but they're being built um, larger and uh, they're being upsized basically because of the CMC steel expansion. You know, I'll, I'll just point out that this uh, economic development project in Queen Creek was front page news. We're talking about 
thousands of jobs. For well, the this region. is a different project. Oh, is it? Yeah. So we're, we're only talking about the CMC still. So the red line is not crossing no. Germain Road into Queen. It is right up against Meridian. I think that's Meridian on the east. So it snugs up the state. This is all inside the city of Mesa. Oh, okay. At this point, our, we're saying we're only doing this for clients in the city of Mesa. All right. Good to know. Thank you. And, and <clears throat> Mayor, to your point, there are several other economic development projects uh, current, and that may be what you're referring to, just to the east of this map. And, and uh, they sent me two maps, and I use this one that shows to the west, but to the east, there's uh, the project Al Alpha and Epicenter, which are both, uh, I don't know if those are announced yet, but um, being considered to the east. Th th this line would also um, be a part of. Okay, so if there's no other questions on that. Um, <clears throat> so the proposed 22, 2022 debt issuances, and these are tax exempt unless, unless you see otherwise, but first of all, uh, the general obligation bonds, so those are the parks and culture, public safety and transportation projects. Um, we've got new bonds of 24 million and refunding bonds from 2012. And that's where you see that 10 year call period or uh, refunding period. We're uh, re refinancing those older bonds that are more expensive. And then on the utility side, um, we've got the utility obligations of uh, new, which are tax exempt of 59 million. And then that, that $16 million piece is what we've just been talking about with the uh, taxable pr projects for uh, supporting, the natural gas projects supporting CMC steel. And then on the utility side, we're planning to refund 69 million. So uh, issue new debt at lower interest rates and pay off the older debt at higher interest rates to achieve interest savings. Some of the utility projects, these are examples. Um, Excuse me, Ryan. Yeah. Well, Ryan, I, you talked about the interest rates on the refunding mechanism. What rates are we adjusting to? What, what were we paying today and what would we refunded at? Yeah, that's a good question. So on the... Um, I mean, it's kind of like redoing your mortgage or anything on your home. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. Yes, and in the general <laughs> obligation side, now, <laughs> we're going to talk about this in a minute, but the general obligation side, the rates have come up, well, on all the rates have come up recently because of inflation and the, the Federal Reserve has started to increase rates. So the, the general obligation um, rates are very close. We were at 3% to 3.25% on our existing debt, so it was already pretty good, and we're just below that now. We're probably about 25 to 3 depending on the day. Um, and so we're going to talk about that in a minute, but we, we may, that may not work. That may not happen, the general obligation bonds, because we're so close on the interest rates to what we already have. When we started the presentation, we were doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Every day it gets <laughs> worse. <laughs> well, and it costs money for refund. Right, and yeah, so you we, know, and you have they, to, we take that into consideration. Because, you know, it's not cheap to refund, and then no, it's not. the difference you're going to save. We're yeah. going to tell you this is what we'd like to do, but when we get to the market and get to sell, we may, we may pull it. Yeah, so. and, and uh, Mayor, Councilmember Freeman, just to uh, tie out on the other, the utility debt, we, those bonds that are being refunded are at four percent, and so there's a little more, um, there's a little more room there. Uh, so we're thinking we get about three percent on the tax exempt, and and about three and a half on the taxable. So on the refunding would be three percent. So there is there is some savings there. We'll show you in a, in a slide here what that estimated still savings even is. historically those rates regardless are still very favorable for us. I mean we'd love half percents but you know realistically anything we can get around threes and fours right now that's pretty good. Okay so um, here we <clears throat> here's some pictures of some um, and some examples of some utility systems projects. There's a full list of projects, and there's lots of them, uh, but that's attached to the, this agenda item. If you look on that top right picture, it might be interesting to know that is a gate station, a natural gas gate station, if you're wondering what that looks like. Um, that's an example of, of what we were just talking about being built out in, um, on that Queen Creek Road project. And uh, sorry, one other project to mentioned down there on the bottom that Central Mesa Reuse Pipeline project is, is part of this bond issuance, debt issuance. On the general obligation projects, here's a few examples there. There's a lot more as well here, but and those are on the attached list. Um, 
The one I wanted to call, we wanted to call out uh, is the police evidence facility. And uh, we'd like uh, to ask um, the city engineer, Beth Huning, to give us a, a, an update on that project. Hi. Um, we just wanted to bring a couple of things up here while we're talking about that project. Um, we originally uh, scoped and envisioned that project in 2017. A lot of things have changed since then, and we wanted to let you know what was going on. Um, the project currently is funded at about $11 million in the bonds that Ryan's talking about today. Today, that project is about $21 million. A couple of things have happened. One, we've changed the site location for the building. We did quite an extensive analysis on workflow and how evidence relates to the police operations. So what we found is it's better to locate it adjacent to HQ headquarters, sorry, and a police headquarters and the forensics laboratory because those are the people that come and go with the evidence. Also centralizes it with the five evidence freezers and the four coolers that we currently have in the HQ building, the headquarters building. So that's one of the big issues because it's a much different site than we originally thought. We're going to a two-story building, a lot of changes. And then on top of that, since in the last four or five years, we've seen about 35% inflation in um, construction costs for buildings of this type. So there's two things that are kind of driving our costs on that project. We want to keep going on the project. Um, because we're seeing inflation, uh, construction cost increases on the order of 300000 to 500000 per quarter. So every quarter we delay, it drives the project up more. So <laughs> we're very anxious to continue. We hope to be back with some GMPs later this year or summer and continue forward with the construction. But it, the project will split funding probably across two bond right. issues. So thank you, Beth. So we, I wanted just to be very clear that while we're listing this project, um, as far as the bond, this series of bonds to issue, it will only cover half of the cost, or about half the cost. Eleven. Uh, and so what that, but at the same time, you know, we are we are really struggling. You can you've read this in the paper just. Um, project costs are just skyrocketing on us, and we're, we're really having to do a lot of creative stop gaps to keep projects going. So the point here is we're going to issue the general obligation bonds that were approved in 20, what year was it? The, for the 2018. 2018. Sorry, thank you. Um, even though it's only half of the necessary cost, what we would like to do is move forward with this approval and then... Um, the contract, we won't be spending down the whole $20 million you know, immediately. And then what we'd like to do is come back to council on the proposed bond package in November and then include the other half of the cost in that. Now, if that doesn't get approved, then we would have to find resources either in the public safety sales tax or in the general fund to cover that cost. But just the, the experience we're having right now with the huge escalation of costs, we just didn't want to delay this any further, as well as it's not only just cost uh, increases, it's just delays in getting materials yes. and labor. So all those things, and this building needs to move ahead of the, of the um, um, police, admi uh, police headquarters administration building being able to move forward too. So, I really just want to let the council know that while you see this, I don't want it to represent that you that this is the entire project. Right now, it's only about half of it, um, and then we'll come back with you on the revisions to the proposed bond package in November. Um, but I just wanted to explain what we're <coughs> trying to attempt to do here. So, thanks, Mr. Freeman. I have a question. What's the picture in the lower right? What's that? That is it. I felt yeah. yeah. to mention that's that's it. So it doesn't even match the police building that we have currently listed. Well, it's going to be rehab <laughs> architecture. So these are our initial concepts. Um, and what you're seeing there is just a part, a very part, a small part of the building. We've got some better renderings and more renderings. But we're working on the colors still to get the blend to work. So we're still talking. It's very early in the concepts right now. We've got the kind of the mass and how it's going to look. And then we'll work to blend some of the colors. Remember, it's storage. It's storage. And I did work. I, we, they, we've had I've had conversations with them about the f view, the facade, out to the public. So we'll work on that. But at the same time, we can't have a lot. There's not. It's freezers and evidence. So we, 
a lot of lighting and stuff. It's kind of drabby to me. But. Oh, yeah. Well, when you see the, we'll get the, when we'll we get bring the, the CMAR forward, we'll bring all the nice pictures, but right. it is a blocky building. There's not much work can do for a storage building, but we will try. There's some features. <laughs> yes. Yeah, speaking as someone who has an office across the yeah, street, well, and I would care about Did I not bring that up? <laughs> yeah, no, we've discussed that, Mayor. I said there's one person that may be having yeah. to you. We're plus, working on Mayor. Plus yeah. the neighborhood to, in that area. We'll yeah. be working with them in public meetings. I know somebody meetings. who lives just down the street, too, so I think people Lots care what the building looks like. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to try to be good neighbors. This is just very early in the concept, so we'll you'll see better things as we come forward with the CMAR. So I, I totally get the urgency of with the, the inflation uh, that's happening right now. So if that's the case, why not bite off the whole enchilada instead of doing half? Is it because? Oh no! Uh, what we're saying there is we're going to do the whole project. Right. But what why not issue the bonds? We only have enough in the bonds for the ten million. That's all was oh, authorized. Because right? it, it's it, the inflation is gone. So much for, our yeah. bonding authority. Right. So back when we and if it. If the election was in 2018, we probably priced this in 2017 17 or earlier, and mm -hmm. we just yeah. had no idea to know that we're probably 30% higher just on that. So, no, we're proceeding forward Thank with you. the project. The funding may come from two different bonds, is what we're suggesting, the 2018 bond and hopefully a 2022 bond also. So we won't have a half-built building? And no, we, no, no. We'll, okay. we'll ask council to authorize the full amount when we bring the project to you. Okay. And, and then we'll have a contingency if we don't get the bonds that, um, because we'll have already issued the contract. We will, the city will have to stand up behind the 10 million somewhere uh, in the budget. And we will, we'll identify other sources that we could do. We'd prefer it to be funded by the next series of bonds in 2022. Mr. Uh, Thompson. Chris, are we going to have the same issue with our Southeast Library? I think we've got that almost under control. Well, we are <laughs> uh, right now. We just selected our contractor yesterday, so we'll know more about the numbers. And, of course, contractors work very closely with architects to kind of bring those back in. But I don't have new numbers yet. We, we, we probably will. I suspect we'll have we're some challenges on that one. It will. Um, but we can deal with that. There is a thought that we heard yesterday in the interviews that maybe the timing of that, because it'll really be construction in 2023, mm -hmm. that there may be some a little bit of pressure relief on some of the items. So we'll wait and see. So, but we did that was the, the pr part of our big conversation yesterday with all the uh, contractors. So, but we'll bring that up when we get closer to that time. But I'll and I could go. We could spend a lot of time, and we probably will have to. There's a lot of projects that are underway right now that we're struggling with as far as um, cost, so. How soon will the police evidence facilities? As I know you're still working in architectural and plans and such. Um, mm -hmm. So is that for like next year you think you'll yeah. start the construction? Uh, Vice Mayor, we're actually looking to bring you the GMP this summer and start construction in the fall of this year. That's oh, why we oh. want to keep going as much as we can keep the momentum up in the project. And we'll be back with final concepts, the way the building's gonna look. We still have a process to get through the design review board and, and the neighborhood. So we'll be back to review the concepts with you at that time. Okay, thanks. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit more about that refunding savings that We've been talking about already a little bit. Um, so the city's financial policy has this, uh, this is, which has been approved by council, has this statement. To ensure that bond refundings produce anticipated savings, refunding bonds should have a net present value savings exceeding 3% of the debt service amount of the bonds being refunded. So if you just remember that 3% savings number, that's, that's the requirement in the city's financial policy. Um, so when we look at these refundings that we're planning to do this year, these refinancings, <clears throat> these were estimates as of a couple weeks ago, and the market's gone up and down since then, so they're, it's probably close, but probably not exactly the same. So we're talking about refinancing those bonds issued 10 years ago at lower interest rates today. And you can see on the general obligation bonds, uh, the estimated savings is about 700000 And if you look at that percentage, it's 2.9% of debt service. So that's is suspiciously close to 3%. Um, so we, if we're not at that 3% threshold, we, we won't ref, refund or refinance those bonds. Uh, we're not planning to. 
because it's not meeting that 3% threshold in the city's financial policies. That, that really, the, the purpose is to, to say, is it really worth it um, to refinance something for that small of a percentage savings? It also, get, it also gives us, uh, if rates come down in the future, it gives us the opportunity to refinance them later at a higher, higher savings. So although you, you're approving that refunding, it, it may not uh, be executed if the savings isn't high enough. On the utility side, the, um, the savings is estimated to be 7.6 million, which is 7.2% of debt service. And like we talked about before, that's because the existing bonds have a higher interest rate on them. And so there's more uh, savings there. There's more cushion um, between uh, that, above that 3% threshold. So the total estimated savings, if the general obligation um, refunding happens, it would be 8.3 million. And if you look down below, you know, the last lot of years, uh, we've been benefiting from these huge refunding savings. And if you look at the last five years, uh, we've saved $68 million as a city in our, in our refundings. And so we've had these huge um, savings in the past. Now rates are higher now and the savings numbers aren't so big, but there's, uh, we, this has been very successful in prior years, and, and it, it, there continues to be some savings. What's the, the purpose for the 3% threshold? Because what's wrong with saving $700,000? Mayor, it goes back to what Councilman Freeman was alluding to, the cost and the effort to uh, refinance these. The, seven, the refunding costs uh, would be quickly yeah. eaten up by a lot of that. Um, not all of it, but then at some point, if, it's, if the savings is only a couple hundred thousand dollars, it, it just the effort it takes and the risk, it, it's just, we, that's why we set the policy at 3%. I've been in other organizations where that threshold's even higher before they'll, they'll do uh, refunding. So it's just the cost of doing it. Ryan, anything else? Yeah, um, Mayor Chris, I, I think that's part of it. And th these costs are, or these savings are net of the costs. Um, oh, but, okay. I think uh, Mike Kennington, we were talking about it, and he said, you know, you only get one bite at the apple on these. So the idea is rates could go down in two years, and the savings might be 8%, you know, it might be higher. That's, that's one reason. Um, but, yeah, really, I think the idea is, well, there's, there's got to be some threshold where it's just not worth the trouble. It may be that if you wait a couple more years, that the savings could be even greater. These are just that are up and el eligible, is that the right word, available to be refunded because of the time of the on yes, the time. So yeah. starting July so they're, they're just up available. They're now available to be considered for refunding. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should always refund it. You might say, well, let's wait and see if the markets improve. And then even two years later, you could get a significant more savings and, um, you know, and take out the same um, bonds. So. Okay. I mean, it, it, but if the savings is net of the expense, right. it still seems like it's... Yeah. Why not? I mean, we, we can hire, you know, a lot of guys to sit in an office and work on this for $700,000. Uh, yeah. So. Well, it's, that's why it's right on the edge, Mayor. This yeah. one is right on the edge, so. So, just for clarification, this number, the 0. 0.7, would be net, less the refunding. Is that what it is? Basis yes. points okay. to uh, refund those dollars. Yes. So what percentage point do we pay on refunding? I mean, that's really in the weeds, but... Uh, yeah, um, Mayor Councilmember Freeman. I think the last time we ran the numbers, it was about it was about two and a half percent. To th it was it was between yeah, it was two and a half percent on the refunding. Okay. So we're at th we're at three or three point two five in the existing debt. Um, so yeah, there is some savings there. Six hundred something thousand rounds up to seven seven hundred thousand. Okay. I think perhaps we could continue the conversation, you know, later, but... Um, okay. Three percent has just been the policy in yeah. place for a while, so... It, it, is it kind of standard uh, financial policy to have something? I mean, would our people that are coming in and analyzing our, our organization, that they'd say, why are you No, the so three percent would be... That'd it's be a very... Totally number. arbitrary, something that we said. No, it's, it's not a, an industry I don't, yeah. It's not my experience, at least in other situations. I've seen numbers higher than that. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and I will mention, um, Mayor Chris, the three percent is is pretty standard, from my understanding. We we do use a three percent of debt service versus three percent of principal, which actually is a little uh, lower number. Um, th that most other entities use uh, principal, 
So that, that's kind of technical, but our threshold is a little bit higher, 3% of a slightly higher base mm -hmm. than other entities. So well, it's well, let's see what the market where, where we shake out, Mayor, and we'll let you know. Okay, thank you. So the timeline for these transactions is that uh, Monday you'll consider authorizing the resolutions. This year there's only two resolutions, one for the utility debt, one for the geo debt. In the past you would have seen uh, more, but we've consolidated those. So you'll see two, two items, you see two items on your Monday agenda. On May, the weeks of May 23rd to June 2nd, we'll be in the market selling these, these five transactions if we do them all. And on June 22nd, we receive all the, uh, the, act, the money, the actual proceeds from the sales. Thank you, Mayor. That's the presentation. Thank you, Ryan. Vice Mayor. Uh, I have one question related to this and just an overall capital debt, you know, bond debt. Um, is there a percentage that we target to say not more than 10% of our budget would we consider to be in a healthy financial situation that we would want to have, you know, with our, our capital and, and our enterprises and everything we have going on, a percentage of that we should not go over in order to be considered to be financially healthy as far as what we totally finance or, um, for capital expenditures. Yeah, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, there, that's a good question. Some, some jurisdictions do have policies like that where they restrict their, their ratios and they force themselves to pay, issue certain levels of debt and structure a certain way. We, we don't. What I, what I will say is the state has uh, a limit on general obligation debt. It's limited to 26% of the city's taxable value. Mm. And ours, we're less than, uh, we're, we're about a third of that. Um, on, a, on the general obligation debt limit. And on the utility side, um, we don't have, uh, we, don't, we, we do have coverage ratio requirements that the bondholders require. So they require that we bring in uh, more, um, they require that we have extra cushion to make the debt payments. Uh, so one and a quarter times coverage, it's called. Mm. Um, and so we're, we're above, um, we're about two and a half times coverage, so we're, we're, so we're that's about a fair, That's a ratio that you, that's how we kind of look at it from that perspective. It's just, they, that's, how the, that's how the rating agencies will ask the yeah. question. And, so, and, yeah. and then we look at it too, um, you know, on the general obligation side, really, you know, the sensitivity there is not only the state limitation, but certainly we have to consider the impact on the secondary property tax mm -hmm. and what that looks like for the cost of a homeowner um, so we, that's something we're very sensitive to. Um, and then on the utilities, it does the same thing, right? It, it can, it drives, it's the, it's the dominant uh, driver of rates today, right? But at the same time, you know, utilities are capital intensive, uh, much more than the general fund, right? Because the, the, the plants and pipes and all the equipment that really drives that. So we're tr that's how we try to balance it out is these ratios, but we also look at it from the perspective of how does it impact either the secondary property tax levy or, and just, just as critically, maybe more critically, on the utility side, what future pressure will it have on rates out into the future? And, and that's kind of how we try to manage it and look at it over a long period of time. And I assume their bond rating is a reflection of our financial health, that we wouldn't have such a high, what's our bond rating again, is it? Uh, Council oh, Member, uh, or I'm sorry, Mayor, Vice Mayor, the, our bond rating on our general obligation debt uh, uh, is AAA, uh, which is the best rating possible. Okay. Uh, from one rating agency, there, we use two rating agencies on each, and it's AA with the other one. On our utility debt, it's, uh, it's, Double A on our existing debt and single A plus on our, um, our on our new debt. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess that's also a measure. Yeah. Of, well, absolutely. You know how we're doing because and that's certainly we're going to go through that finance. gauntlet of meetings with rating agencies in the next couple of weeks, so we'll let you know <laughs> how we're doing. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. And I brought this up during our uh, sustain sustainability and transportation uh, committee meeting. On, the, um, on our climate action plan, Chris, as we start moving towards a, car, a, a neutral carbon footprint, um, that means reduction in the use of our natural gas system. What, is, what type of downward pressure is that gonna put on 
our ability to pay our utility uh, revenue obligations into the future because well, the natural gas system does generate a lot of revenue for the city and our enterprise fund, right? Well, it does proportionate as much as any other, right? It's not disproportionate. I think the good news, I, I'll let Frank talk about it. I think the, the future for the natural gas enterprise is probably as bright as it's ever been considering the number of users that he's getting ready to hook up. I mean, he could be, that could be, I don't know, I think the best days are ahead for the natural gas utility based upon the industries that are seeking high volume um, uh, services. So doing, we just you know, talked about the one. So actually, I think on that side, we're pretty excited about what the future is for that. Well, we're buying three new excavators, too. <laughs> three new excavators, well, yes. Um, but I'm just saying, I think on the natural gas and uh, side, we're doing well. Um, so yeah, I think we're, 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 I think we're fine on that side. I don't, I don't know that on the, I think of that correlation so much. I think the natural gas is seen as a little bit more cleaner than, you know, carbon and using, you know, regular gas. And that's, you know, our fleet, part of our fleet program is to um, do the flare to fuel, right? And get credits for the natural gas. So I think we see natural gas as actually one of the strong assets for the city going forward. I agree. <laughs> I knew you, you would. <laughs> Uh, I'll just say that, that sometimes we are, uh, our critics will s s look at, you point to the amount of bond debt that we have and say, look how that this is irresponsible, you're, you're running the city on a credit card. And uh, so presentations like this are important for, for us to educate folks so that they know that there are, we're, we're well within industry and, and legal limits with the amount of debt that we have, uh, less, you know, compared to many other cities. And also reminding folks that we are, unusually engaged in utility service in Mesa. So when, when you go apples to apples with other cities, most other cities don't aren't as engaged in these heavy uh, in industries of, of providing utilities like we are. So, uh, and Mayor, to your point, um, and I've told, I've said this since the day I got here, one of the most significant drivers of economic development for the city of Mesa that helps us stand apart from many others is our utilities. And, and, you know, but they're very expensive. Having water treatment plants, having um, water plants, having gas and electric, um, you look at the growth of Mesa just in the last three to four years, I mean, the pressure for us to continue to extend utility, despite the, the huge investment we've made, the continued pressure for us to continue to grow and expand our utilities has never been greater, but because that's be, and but it's driving a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to bring uh, enterprise and industry to Mesa. Now, um, we're excited now because a lot of the developers are coming in now are finding much more economical or efficient ways to reduce their water consumption. But on the gas side, it's becoming a huge demand for us. So we're we're very excited about that. And as as a as an advocate for the, uh, the climate action plan, I, I don't see a, uh, a disconnect with the, the natural gas expansion at all. I mean, I think most, uh, it will, we'll have our, our sustainability department up in a little while, but I think most uh, advocates for the environment understand that you, you don't go, you know, you don't eliminate natural gas. Natural gas is a, is a great interim use as, you know, technology over the next few decades will advance and you know, maybe a few decades from now, uh, natural gas will not be a, a, a big deal, but for, for the for foreseeable future, it will be. Oh, yeah. So. I think natural gas, though, is, as a whole, is under attack right now um, across the nation, across the world. I mean, you see cities in California and New York and others that are eliminating the use of natural gas in their communities altogether. And... Um, you know, obviously we can't do that here. The legislature put a stop to that last year or so. But, um, you know, it's still, to me, it's, you know, coming from that industry, it's still one of the cleanest um, uses uh, that we have. So, yeah. And, I, and I'm agreeing with you. And that, that's why I made the comment that uh, I don't see it as a disconnect to, to be enthusiastic and aggressive with a, a climate action plan, but at the same time incorporate natural gas into that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. <coughs> All right, next item is item 2B is a presentation on utility projects included in the capital improvement program. Welcome.
Welcome back, Brian. Morning, Mayor and Council. Brian Richel, uh, Management and Budget Assistant Director, the Office of Management and Budget. So with the, with the uh, presentation that was presented by Ryan, the city treasurer, of bonding, all of that, uh, what, we're, what I'm going to focus on, in, on is the, the capital improvement for the utilities uh, for 23-27, but really focusing on the projects that are coming up this uh, next fiscal year. So we'll just discuss the capital improvement and then review uh, active projects, uh, utility projects, and then we'll go through the next steps. Uh, just kind of as a reminder, some of the utilities uh, funding sources, the local revenues, which is basically your, the rate revenues for the, the utilities themselves, but then also uh, the utility revenue obligations that the presentation was just talking about. So we do a lot of the, the, uh, the funding through those. And similar to the uh, the uh, non-utilities. What we do in the forecast is we also look at the operations and maintenance, and we re review that throughout the CIP project life cycle. But then also budget to ensure that the city can maintain the operations uh, of those facilities. For example, um, plant maintenance costs for expansions, also the chemical cost to treat wastewater, and e any additional staff that's needed if we do expand any facilities uh, that are needed. So we look at that and then what we do is we take that and put that out into the forecast uh, also along with the, uh, the cost of the projects and the debt associated with it. So just a, a highlight of some of the current uh, projects that were finished this year. So one is the Val Vista Water Treatment Reservoir uh, replacement. Uh, the total cost was 4.2, that was finished this year. And then also um, the Lewis East transformer switch replacement for the electric side that was uh, completed in, with a cost of $4.7 million. So a lot of the projects are still going on. Those are just two of the, the main projects that were finished this year. So moving on to some of the proposed utility projects, and I'm just highlighting a few of them. Uh, we have several that will be part of the, uh, the program. But to highlight the Signal Butte water treatment plant, this will increase water treatment uh, by 24 MGD uh, million gallons per day and add a eight million gallon reservoir. The, uh, the total cost of this is 145 million, but for 22, 23 in this coming up uh, fiscal year, is will be 9.7 million. Another one is a central Mesa reuse pipeline uh, that's been uh, presented to you before. That'll help bring uh, reuse water down to the Gila River Indian community. That total cost is around 100 million uh, right now with 22, 23 would be about 10.1 million. And then also the, uh, we're looking at doing new groundwater wells, uh, drilling four wells, but also uh, doing five collection lines. And this will help with redundancy and water treatment and uh, help meet with the demand growth, especially down in the southeast part of Mesa. So the cost of this is about 22 million for 22, 23 would be 8.5. And then on the wastewater side, we're looking to do a project at the Northwest Water Reclamation Plant, some improvements. This will help replace aging infrastructure. It's been a, uh, it's been a few years since there's been a uh, improvements, major improvements done to this facility. And they're also looking to do some efficiency improvements. This total cost throughout the, the, pro, the uh, program is 35 million, but for 22, 23 in the budget for this coming up year would be 7 million. And then also the Southeast Water Reclamation Plant improvements, uh, improvements uh, process improvements, along with they're looking to replace electrical and control upgrades and replacements of those. Total cost is about 8.2. Uh, next fiscal year would be uh, about half that for $4 million. And then also looking to replace sewer line replacements. So just going through the system and replacing the aging pipes. This, we're, uh, the program we're looking to put 31 million and for next fiscal year would be about $8 million. So that's on the wastewater side. Moving over to the natural gas, some of the major projects that we're looking to uh, start this coming up fiscal year is the Gansell Road Project. It, what it would do is put the, the new 
12 inch high pressure main and this will help feed for commercial and residential growth but also for redundancy of the Gantz and future gate stations. This cost is roughly uh, 28 million for next year. It's for the beginning phases of it would be about 2.3 million in the budget. And then also uh, the Brown uh, Broadway Road improvements. This is to replace existing high and intermediate uh, pressure gas mains to improve system reliability. Uh, estimates are about 3.7 for the project and about 2.3 for next fiscal year. And then also look into add new gas lines just throughout the residential and commercial developments uh, to in because of due to the growth of the southeast and also the magma district in residential and commercial. So we're roughly putting 12 million into the program, but for next fiscal year, we're budgeting $4 million. On the electric side, we're looking to, for that, we're looking to do the police department campus uh, microgrid. I know Frank, the energy resources director, has briefed uh, council on that, but I uh, will probably, is here for any more questions on that. What is to do is to uh, install electric generators uh, communications and electric switching to generate power for the electric utility, but also provide uh, backup power in instances of outages for that campus and any other uh, uh, buildings on that campus. So the cost is around $9 million in the program. So this coming up fiscal year, we're looking to put $7 million into the budget for this project. The other one is the for smart cities. It's a 69 kV looping system. And what this is to do is there's two kV line transmission lines throughout the system that loop and what's considered an open loop scheme. What this is to do is to make it a closed loop scheme for uh, reliability and redundancy of the system. So for instance, if there is an outage, what will happen is just that local isolated area will only have the outage while they fix it while everyone else sh uh, will have uh, still should have uh, electric and then also what's in the program is for new electrical services so it, this is primarily due as as we know is the growth of commercial developments in the electric service area so with the new electrical service we're looking at uh, 10.8 million in the total program and for the budget this coming up year is to the beginning, the starting or beginning, beginning of it, sorry, of 22, 23 would be about $1.1 million. So that's kind of just a quick overview of the utility CIPs, the major ones that are uh, in the budget for fiscal year 22, 23 and some of uh, what the costs would be in the, in the budget. So next steps for the utility CIP on April 30th, we had uh, public notice uh, proposed fiscal year 23 through 27 capital improvement would be posted. And then on May 16th, a public hearing and council consideration for the capital improvement uh, program would go in front of council. I know it's kind of a brief overview, but it's kind of a, some of the project, major projects that are going on for the utilities. And I know Ryan, the city uh, treasurer, kind of briefed you on some of those. I will be bonded uh, coming up. All right, Brian, I think you saw we've got some anxious uh, council members to run some questions by. Should we start with the vice mayor? Sure. Okay. Um, on the water, new groundwater wells, can I have a little more information on why we're drilling them, how the water is being used? Is there any regulating authority about taking water out of the ground versus our canal system? Uh, mayor, vice mayor. So right now we have about 10 wells in different stages of activity. So the new, well, I'll start with the new wells. So in Southeast Mesa, uh, our well field serves as a backup supply um, to our service water. Um, and in the summer, it helps with peaking. So we need to grow our well field in Southeast Mesa just to keep up with, with growth and economic activity. So we have four new wells that are in design right now for drilling. And then we have six other wells, uh, more in this part of town, that are 50 years old. They have holes in the casing. They're just beyond their useful life. So we're redrilling those. And then we're about to submit a design request for four new wells for the next round of uh, new wells in Southeast Mesa. So we're going into a very active period of time for wells. The last decade or so was really a lot of uh, attention on plan expansion and transmission mains. 
and, and the wells largely did not have a lot of investment, but now we're going into a point where we have to catch up with that investment. So it's more for, it's more for supply to answer, hopefully I'm answering your question. And Chris, so you, we count it as one of our key components to our water portfolio. It's, you know, totally rely on it, but it, but it has a role in our water portfolio, whether it's, you know, wells or surface from the different watersheds, this is an important part of that portfolio. Right, right. so on that point, we're in a very uh, enviable and unique position where we have over half a million long-term storage credits. We've built up over a long period of time by uh, recharging into the, gr the gross recharge basins. So with that uh, amount of long-term storage credits, we need the well capacity to be able to pull that out um, for whatever period of time where we need to supplement our surface water. So to what extent are we pulling it out? I know it's in our portfolio, but I mean, between CAP and SRP, that's plan A and A1, right? Well, and, but the wells are right there, right? Yeah. Because if so we're not doing our stall in the aquifer. How much is groundwater in, yeah. our, in what but, we're normal using? But as far as a total, it's not significant relative to the other two, right, Chris? What's the In terms of, of groundwater pumping? Yeah. Well, yeah. We prefer to not pump groundwater at all, but yeah. um, the fact is we need to um, pump groundwater in the summer just for peak. Peak demand goes up so high, it's more than a factor of two versus in the winter time. Um, and then for recovering credits, um, I would say our total, the total groundwater pumping we do is, is in the 10 to 20% range. If you want to look at um, 80 to 90% of our water is supplied through surface water and water treatment, and then a small percentage is through wells. Okay. And there are is it AMWA or there is a regular? ADWR. That regulates. Uh, mm -hmm. That regulates. Right, right, exactly. So that's part of our assured water supply. Um, there's a certain allocation we get for groundwater pumping any given year as part of our 100 year assured water supply. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but you're, you're kind of talking about two different animals. I mean, you can't tap the grass water supply right now. You don't have any wells, right, Brian? I mean, there's no wells in the grass system to take and tap that water. So I think as, as a city, we should look at getting some well sites up in that northern area uh, for the grass. But then uh, when you talk about water credits, the water credits are important for our portfolio, but yet we have to exchange some of those credits with some of the other uh, water suppliers, whether it's CAP or SRP. As, I know as, Brian, Brian was anxious to come up here. Could you tell? <laughs> yeah, you were standing up. <laughs> Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, members of the council. Um, as part of, Chris had mentioned our designation of assured water supply, and a, and a portion of that is our groundwater, so they give us an allocation of groundwater, and we have to prove that it's physically and legally available to us. And so we've done that through hydrologic studies. And so we have the water, it's the ancient water that has accumulated over thousands of years. Chris also mentioned uh, grusp, and that's water we recharged into the aquifer up at, uh, you know, North Mesa. And to your point, Council Member Freeman, all our wells are permitted as recovery wells, and we're able to, on paper, we're pumping those recharge credits. Okay. Um, we do have just a handful of wells that are in the area of impact of where that recharge occurs. And so Mesa has been in recent contact with SRP about sharing some of their new wells that they put in North Mesa, allowing us to jointly use those wells and possibly pump that into our distribution system and we would be recovering those credits from the area of impact. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Yeah. Other questions, Mr. Thompson? Yeah, I'm, uh, I like this, um, the microgrid for the um, PD campus and uh, especially the, the use of, you know, having it as a backup in case of power failures. But I'm also interested in the peak shaving. And, and when you look just at the peak, sh uh, peak shaving, um, do we know what our ROI is on this? Um, you know, because right now we have to go out and, and purchase that power on the market. What is, do you know, happen to know what our they, ROI they, they've is? They've looked at it, yeah. It's based on recent experience. Right, I mean, because this kind of goes back to the conversation we had a couple of months ago, right, about 
how our power, our energy costs went went up like 300 percent. And so this is really, really kind of uh, a cool, cool project. Yeah, uh, Mayor and Council. So, you know, we view this as the, the city has plenty of backup generators around the, the city, but this will be kind of the only one that really pays for itself, like you're seeing through um, offsetting peak energy purchases. And we look at it on an annual basis, forecasted out five to 10 years with multiple scenarios. And in almost all those scenarios, it's able to run about 5,000 hours a year, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, depending on gas prices in the electric market. So as it sits right now, um, we'll, we see it as being able to run about 5,000 hours and during those 5,000 hours being able to pay off its, both its capital cost and its maintenance cost. So it's a net benefit to our electric customers. And, and we would be using debt um, to fund this so that it spreads the cost over the period of time and the benefits of all those customers over there is benefit from the installation. And we're looking at other types of generation technologies as well. Uh, Councilmember Freeman and I have had a lot of conversation about what some of SRP's plans are and how it melds and integrates with what we're talking about. It's also important to note that with, with the amount of solar that we're starting to bring into our resource mix over time, we need this type of internal generation to um, firm up, if you will, those types of resources that are intermittent, that, that may be there one minute, but may not be there the next, but the demand is still there and we need to, to serve that demand. These are the types of units that can start up very, very quickly, serve that load reliably and efficiently and keep our rates affordable with that peak shaving tool. And, and this kind of goes back to the previous presentation. So we're gonna issue the debt which is typically a 10-year debt, but our ROI is gonna be five to seven years based off of savings, saving calculations, I right? believe the term of most of our debt is 20 years or more. Or 20 years, yeah. So it, it may be a little bit different with this taxable issuance for that particular purpose, but most of our debt that we use to fund our utility infrastructure inside our system is 20 or more years. Yeah, I don't think we're, I don't think we're proposing to change that in the issuance for the taxable debt, are we? For 20-year term? Or is it pretty consistent with everything else? When we issue taxable debt. Um, Mayor, council members, the, 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 this taxable debt issuance is an exception. Our utility debt right now, we're issuing at 24 years. Um, and the, the reason we issued the taxable debt short was that, so we, it was that whole 10 year call thing. You pay for that. and so in order to, to not have to pay for it on the taxable and the tax exempt issuances. We separated them so we had one, the tax would be short and the tax exempt be long. Um, but really, well, all of our- we know we're getting reimbursed on the taxable side right. too. So, so we, didn't care, we don't care about it for that That's reason. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so really all our utility debt is 24 years except this one. Because it's getting reimbursed, we're getting paid back, so. Mr. Reddy, on this uh, microgrid, have we, uh, has the federal government issued any guidance on uh, uh, any other infrastructure uh, funding out there? No. Uh, would this be a, something, an innovation as far as uh, how we can expand our, our system here? I don't, know, I don't know that we specifically looked at this project, but we certainly can. I know Mr. Butler's been aware sure. of this, but we can follow up to see. Um, I, don't, didn't, I haven't run across anything specific to this kind of project, okay. but... Um, Frank, are you aware of something? Yeah, we, we, we um, were looking into a grant that goes through the State Department of Emergency Management, and unfortunately the, oh. the bureaucratic hoops that you have to jump through were inconsistent with being able to develop a project like this. So we're looking at this as kind of a pilot project. We want to develop the microgrid here. We want to develop the microgrid for the uh, Mesa Art Center where the chilled water systems chillers are at, so there's not enough emergency generation, backup generation, for that system to operate in the event of a system-wide outage. So that's an important next project. So we are looking for ways to find alternative sources of funding rather than just issuing debt and having that debt sur service burden our customers. So grants, um, loan programs, that kind of stuff, we're, we're continuously searching for those. Right now, we're trying to get this thing designed and planned for and integrated with the um, PD work that's going on there with the remodeling and the and the work that's going on at MG. So that's our focus right now. Um, once we get 
a little bit further along into that, we're going to really start being aggressively looking at grant programs. We've also got a couple of consultants that are out looking for grant programs as well. And maybe not under the infrastructure sure. package, but maybe there's something else. Perfect. And then a question outside of, of this topic, but on the water treatment plan, is that our, our cost? I know we share costs with other cities, but is that totally Mesa's cost? If you would, if the if it were um, if it were Greenfield, that is our is that regional partner. Field? This is Signal View, so it's all that's ours. Just our Mesa. Okay, perfect. And I guess that's really a wastewater plant. The uh, Greenfield the plant Greenfield. is so. Okay. Thank you. I have a question on the water again, um, but uh, I think this is important: the Central Mesa reuse pipeline. I, th I think three years ago we talked about kind of starting this project, um, and I think the cost was estimated 60, 70 million, and then we kind of two years ago like 80 million, and now we're up at 100 million. You don't so, want to ask tomorrow either because it'll. Well, happen. that's what I'm getting at. I think the urgency is to complete these. We, and we're, yeah, talk about pipelines. where we're at. Okay. That's where we're but, at on the project. But then on, let me just mm -hmm. end with this too. This is an assured water supply that to add to our portfolio when we get it down to the GRIC. And this is very, very important for our sustainable water yep. supply in our city. Yep. And this is something, you know, we have a contract with them, but we're not able to really execute the full potential of that contract. Well, and they're not ready to receive it either. So it's a, both of us are having to get ready, so. But what you didn't say is, is um, you know, when this pipeline would be completed. Sure, yeah. go ahead, Chris. Talk. So, okay, I'll, dr I'll address the cost question first. Um, so Mayor, Council Member Freeman, um, when we were in the middle of the alignment study a couple of years ago, uh, we started with some conceptual <coughs> cost studies. And I remember the pipe, so the pipeline itself was about 72 million, if I remember correctly, and there was a, another 10 plus million for the treatment plant, the pumping array improvements that we would have to do um, to make this pipeline work. So we are, we are always in, in the 80 to 90 million range. So it has gone up. It's closer, as Brian said, it's closer to 100 million right now is our best estimate with inflation. And in terms of completion, we're looking at February of 2025. Okay. So mayor and council with that, we also do have, there is a return on investment uh, with this project that helps us in the utility fund to where we do have that forecasted out. Roughly right now with the numbers, they could change depending on when it goes, is about $200,000 in 25, 26 of savings. And then it, it doubles each year. So then we have the following year, it's 400,000 the following year. It has year, a direct re So ROI. there is a direct okay. ROI to this project, which okay. helps it. Yeah. Over the life of the agreement with the tribe or? Yeah, well, the, that's 100 years, but just taking this debt service and applying the cost of, the sa I guess it's the savings, savings that we get from this water supply versus others. The differential between what we'll pay for this versus what we pay for other water is significant. Yeah. Right, it's about a third to a quarter per acre <laughs> foot, the cost of this water. It's high priority water, which is of course good, mm -hmm. but then when we make our cap order every October, we front load the <coughs> order with the cheaper water. And the more we deliver to the Gila River community, the more we have in our portfolio to front load. Okay, thank you. Julie. So can you just help me understand um, or remind me, all of these are new projects, like none of them have been started or some of them have already been started. When you have the total cost, but then the amount that's next year, is it, do you have like a schedule of, you know, Favorite. when the rest of it's gonna be paid off and all that? Yes, Mayor, Councilmember Spillsbury. The, some of them are uh, uh, underway in design or feasibility study, uh, things like that. So we do have them structured out and we do have a schedule that I can uh, get from engineering on kind of the schedule of when these will, will go into uh, or be completed. But right now, most of these are, uh, some of them are designed for next year, some of them are brand new, but some of them have been designed and will be starting construction costs coming up in this coming year. So, so, so we have a five-year CIP, so you could go into there. And what, what we're doing is we're taking, here's the five-year program, but we're telling you next year, here's the financial impact of the of that first-year CIP, the cost's going to hit us. But it'll show all these projects showing the different um, dollar amounts they may need clear out for the next five years. And the cost is just related to where they're at, what stage they're at. Yeah, the whether it's design yes, phase. The cost for next, yeah, yeah. Uh, the cost for next fiscal year is just where they're at right now, how much we would need to budget in next year's 
budget to be able to complete the tests that they're doing now. The total cost I provided was just to give you a sense of the total cost of the project. So for example, like this central reuse pipeline. So if that's 100 million total and it's only 10 million next year, then 90 million would be in the next four years after that? Or maybe less. Or less. Or less. Yes, mm -hmm. Chris just said it would be done in 2025. 20, so we, you'll, when you see the CIP, we'll, when we get the CIP, we'll show you what, you know, there's a first year number, and that's the one because it's in front of council, you have to authorize that. But we also show you, you know, the subsequent years and the project cost for that out five years. Now, they don't all take five years to do, but they may have different costs starting at different times. So since I wasn't here like four years ago when you were doing this presentation, with the projects that you were talking about then that you'd still be paying off, are th those don't show up in a presentation like this, but they're just they're still in a, part they're of in our... A, they're in a document that we share with you that you can we Of can what get we're to. still like paying it's, off. Yeah. But then these are just all the newer ones. Yes. Newer or some of these might have been in that CIP and now we're just finally getting to them. Getting to okay. them. I'm just trying to figure out how that all works. Yeah, we'll get you, when we get a copy of a CIP, you'll, we can show that to you. That okay, time. great, thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question. Uh, well, this is not a question, but we were talking about the, the Northwest Water Reclamation Plant and, and that it's time to go back and, you know, it's, it's been a few years, time to upgrade things. And I, I've had the, the chance to go by there a few times the last few months looking at the, the ASU algae project mm -hmm. and other things. And it just kind of reminded me of the obvious, which is that the uh, I'm, I'm curious to talk with someone, not now, but later, about the, the, the use of that that percolation pond, you know, uh, <laughs> north of the water reclamation plant. It, it's such a high profile piece of property for our city. It's literally at the yep. intersection of the 101 and the 202. And it just always seems like this unused remnant that uh, has potential. Now, I, I, I don't think it has any commercial potential because how do you build an off ramp from an off ramp? <laughs> Pretty right? difficult but, access, yeah. But I think it's still, I mean, if we're spending tens of millions of dollars across the, the highway, I think there already are, there's some access. We already have pipes going from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious to just, uh, as long as we're redesigning that area, let's think about, do we want to do a algae pond? Do we want to do uh, solar panels? Do, is there some some useful purpose for that piece of property that's so prominent that we all drive by multiple times a week, if not multiple times a day. Uh, so we can have that conversation here. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Next on our agenda, item 2C is a presentation on the Water Resources Department budget. Feel like I'm already warmed up. I <laughs> like that. <laughs> so I'm here today with, with Seth Weld, our deputy director, and um, it's our pleasure to talk about our budget for fiscal year 22-23. And with that, we'll start with our purpose, which is to provide superior <laughs> water and wastewater services to our community. And our strategy for doing this is to focus on services that uh, focus on reliability safety and sustainability amongst others. Um, and with that, uh, we first like to talk, before we get into numbers, talk about five of our performance metrics. This first one needs a little bit of explanation um, because it's a weird number, 0 0.026. So let me just first explain uh, how we get there, so bear with me. So what this metric measures is the number of main breaks we have in any given month that put uh, one or more customers out of service for four hours or greater. So uh, that's the category. Um, and you divide that number by the number of customer connections you have in the thousands. So for us, we have about 150,000 customer connections. So we're dividing the, the number of events um, by 150. So uh, hopefully you're with me so far. <laughs> So to make it easy, uh, three events in one month, that's our target, and that equates to 0 0.02. So we, we use that as the target. Um, for the month of March, we had one more than that. We had a very active main break uh, month in March, so we had 
uh, 0.026, so we popped above that line slightly. Now, if we had done this presentation in any of the eight prior months, it would be a different color, and we'd say we met or surpassed that goal, but we happen to have a pretty active March. But I will add, for this metric, we're very, very aggressive with the three, uh, the three events per month. Um, for a, a city our size, um, the expectation would be we'd be up closer to 10. So three would be um, more in line with the city that might only have 75,000 or, or 100,000 people. We're a 500,000 per, uh, person city. So um, we want to be aggressive because it's, it's a reflection of our maintenance program. Um, so that's just a little explanation on that one. Uh, moving to the next metric. Up, I see I'm sorry, before you do that. Um, on the metrics, on the performance measures, why don't we have like an annual or year to date? Or why, why do we look at it just as a monthly? We, because that has been discussed. We need to start showing these on an annual basis or a rolling 12 month period. We, we can do that as opposed to just snapping off one month. That's yeah, a very good point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank so you. noted. We noticed that right before we came, but we will probably make those adjustments in the future because any one month probably could be a variation. But if you look over a longer period of time, like Chris just said, we're actually doing very well. Right. Yeah, that's correct. So you can you can look at the trend. I mean, you can look at how we perform over time. Um, but as we report um, here today, we're giving you a snapshot for a smaller period, like a month. Uh, the next metric we want to look at is system water loss. Um, so what we're measuring here is the total water that we're taking into the treatment plants and we're pumping from wells. So it's wh where we're starting with. And then we're comparing that to all of our build water. So that difference is our <coughs> lost and unaccounted for water. Um, and that happens through uh, events like leaks, main breaks, um, and it can even be uh, non-apparent losses, just like meters that are under-reporting. So all of that added up together uh, translates into our water loss. We usually hover around 5% water loss. Um, there's, you can see an erratic pattern in the last couple of months on, on the graph. And <laughs> that's explained by we're changing methodologies. We're going to a new AWWA methodology called M36. It's a little bit more intensive. We had a lot of training with it, but in the last couple of months, we've had to do a lot of manual switchover, and, and that's just, it's causing a little bit of erraticism in, in the graph. Um, when we do get back on track with this new methodology, uh, we expect to be four to five percent water loss, but one good news point is that once we complete the smart water program, we're gonna have that whole population of water meters that are changed over to brand new water meters. So we'll have a lot of the older meters, which are under reporting now brand new meters that are more accurate so we expect our water loss to go probably into three three to four percent range um, and then one final note what's acceptable industry-wide and for this category is ten percent we never want to be above ten percent that's a lot of water loss and that translates into an economic hit so being at five percent or less is is really our target Chris um, excuse me <laughs> Since you brought it up, on <laughs> the smart meters, where are we on that project as far as installing smart meters? We, so we are in phase one, and phase one is really just, uh, it, it's like a pilot. It's taking a small population of water, gas, and electric meters, about 2,000 total, and it's really making sure that the connectivity is there so that not only do you have a new meter with a radio transmitter, but then the signal is properly going through a base station communication network. It's getting into our system. It's clean information. Um, it's accepted by our billing system. And then at the end of the day, we put out a good, accurate, timely bill. So we wanted to have a year program where we make sure that the whole ecosystem works well. We're in the middle of that right now. Um, we have meters on order. So sometime this summer, we'll install those first couple thousand meters the base stations, um, that construction is in progress. We're starting with about half a dozen base stations. Um, once we're successful with that, about this same time next year, we'll start the whole city, full deployment, and that'll take three, maybe four years. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the third metric has to do with beneficial use of water. And of course, we want to make 100% um, beneficial use of, uh, in particular, this is reclaimed water or effluent. Um, so we weren't 100%. We were about as close as you can get, 98.8%. And how that would be explained is probably one to two days of, of the gross recharge basins being out of service, and we'd have to divert out to the Salt River. 
So it would be a short period where we had to do that. Uh, I'm happy with this number. It's very close to 100%. When we do have the reuse pipeline in place, that will give us more redundancy where we're delivering that water to the Gila River community. And then on, on some occasions, we can also recharge the grass, but we'll have very little occasions where we're forced to waste water to the Salt River. So that's going to be another big benefit to that project. Uh, going to our fourth measure, I've talked about this one um, here in this setting before. This is uh, sanitary sewer overflows. Um, so for a system our size, uh, what would be industry acceptable for a threshold would be 17 to 18 sewer overflows per year. Um, our system, historically, we're, we're fortunate. We have a good maintenance program. We're much lower than that number. So we decided to set our threshold at two events per quarter, which translates into eight per year, which would be less than half of the expectation for our city. So far this quarter, we're young into the quarter, but we have zero. Um, but you can see over history, we do a pretty good job at staying below the threshold. And our final performance measure to talk about today is uh, nitrogen removal at the Greenfield Reclamation Plant. The reason that's important is nitrogen compounds like ammonia and nitrates, they're very harmful to aquatic life. Um, so our effluent could come, come in contact with aquatic life and, and cause damage if it's high in, in nitrate concentration or ammonia concentration. So the state regulatory limit is 10 milligrams per liter. There's an alert level of 8 milligrams per liter. Uh, you can see since the greenfield expansion was completed, we're, we're doing real well. We're trending down. There was one point during the expansion when we we're, we we're bringing our new aeration basins online. And those are important because that's where the microorganisms live that consume the, the nitri nitrogen. Um, we popped right above uh, the alert limit, nowhere near the regulatory limit. But that was during construction and during that transition. But since the construction's been complete, we're heading in the right direction. Now, um, so we're going to get in. No, oh, sure. Sorry. While we're talking about wastewater, I know we did the pilot program. We were just at it. ASU Polytech, and they talked about the algae program, and that um, remove and takes the gases and then converts it into a biofuel or other usable sources. So, we're have we completed that pilot program at the Northwest? Oh, with the algae? With the algae? I don't know. I yeah, Mayor, Vice Mayor. So they've concluded um, their research for that program, for that particular grant-funded program. Um, so now they've compiled the data and they're doing all the reporting, but they're, they're, done, they're done with that phase of it. We haven't seen a final report on the data, but it was a successful pilot. And um, so what it does is it, it takes the biogas, which is heavy in CO2, it's heavy in methane, and they use these membranes which filter out the CO2 and direct it into the, to the raceways where the algae grows, because the algae uses the CO2 as food, food and sunlight and other nutrients. Um, and then once you grow that algae, it grows really fast. Then there's a number of things you can do with it. You can squeeze out the lipids and make biodiesel. You can dry it out and you can use it in the pharmaceutical industry. You can use it as food, even in our own wastewater treatment plant, food for the microorganisms. So, there's a lot of end products that you can do with it. That was, so that was their study, and, but they're wrapping it up to your question. Is there any next steps identified? And is that a, a model that can be used? They're, they're interested. For right. Our we're in right, sorry to cut you off. No. We're, we're in conversation with them. Um, they're very interested. They were, they were hopeful with the results of this pilot, and they would like to, to take it to the next level and, and look at other opportunities. So we had a, actually a, a team call or a Zoom call the other day with ASU, one of their um, folks at Polytechnic, about future opportunities. OK, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get into the numbers now. And um, Seth is going to take this first slide. And we're going to talk about um, budget requests tied to our CIP program. Good morning. As we've talked about, and as Brian mentioned in his presentation, not only do we plan the projects and estimate the completion and the, and the time frame that we need it, but we also need to project the operational and maintenance support that goes with each of these projects. So as some of these projects are beginning to kick off and or come online, we've got some additional positions that we need to bring on. With the Signal View water treatment uh, plant expansion, we need to add another treatment process specialist. Right now, we have one on staff that is currently shared between Brown Road and Signal Butte. 
but with the expansion of the signal view plant, one person would not be able to, to dedicate enough time to adequately watch that treatment process. These are the guys who really dial in that treatment process and maximize that efficiency of the operation of that plant. For the Central Mesa Reuse Pipeline, we're looking to add a couple of more field coordinators to the two that we already have on staff. Um, the two today struggle to maintain and keep up with the workload that we have. Um, they are frequently working overtime, working you know extended weeks, and that just isn't sustainable going into some of these larger projects that we've got coming up. So those positions will work closely with the design and the construction teams through that design and construction process to identify um, challenges where we may be crossing uh, major utilities, uh, where we may have some conflicts. Um, those guys also complete the inspections on the work that is completed. Uh, by having them on staff and doing that inspection, we're able to identify you know, potential issues that we can resolve while project is still active. That way, once project closes, we don't come back later and reopen it. Along with that, we're looking to add a crew leader, an equipment operator, and a field worker, and the associated equipment that they'll need. Their primary responsibility will be to maintain this entire reclaimed pipeline. Today, we have 28 miles of pipeline. We're adding another, another roughly 11 miles. Along with the addition of the distance, we're adding 17 pumps, additional uh, air release valves, control valves, and there's four pumping stations along the route of that pipeline. We want to get these guys involved in the beginning so that they can become really intimately uh, familiar with that entire infrastructure because it is so critical to our future on the water supply. The Northwest Water Reclamation Plant process improvements. Uh, we are adding additional assets on things like our headworks, our grip removal system, uh, a new methanol feed system. Uh, along with that, it brings additional man hours to maintain that equipment. So we need to add another maintenance specialist to properly maintain that equipment. Along with those new systems, we need an additional <coughs> operator. They're the ones that go around and check the operation of all of this equipment. Therefore, there are additional daily checks that are going to need to be performed to maintain the optimum efficiency. OK, I'm going to get into three specific operating budget requests. And then Seth is going to finish up with some high-level summary tables. Um, our first request has to do with the reclassification of a chemist. So um, as a refresher, our chemists take all of the field samples, the required regulatory field samples, and they do the laboratory testing to verify um, the constituents in those samples. We have lived for a long time with four chemists, uh, going back more than 25 years. And we were able to hold four chemists for a long time because of automation and advances in technology. So we could do more with a smaller number of people. But then we got to a point a decade or so ago where we needed to bring on at least a temporary part-time chemist and, and we've been operating like that for quite a while and then we got to the point where well we outgrew that so now we used an outside uh, third-party lab to make up the difference uh, the excess in laboratory testing so now we're at the point where for a very small incremental number less than ten thousand dollars we can bring home some of that outside laboratory testing and then just convert the half-time chemist to a full-time chemist bringing our total to five at the Greenfield Reclamation Plant, um, as you know, we've recently expanded that plant. And through the life of the construction in 2017, we added a maintenance technician. And then again in 2019, towards the end of the expansion, we added a maintenance technician. But part of that project was working with our consultant to use a new work order system. And we've added um, thousands of new assets with the expansion. And then have also loaded into that work order system all of our existing assets. And then now over time, in, in having some, some time under our belt using that work order system, we found that we have an inordinate percentage of, of uh, reactive work orders versus uh, preventative work orders. It should be flipped the other way around. We want to be taking care of preventative work orders with a smaller percentage of reactive. So we're flipped. And with that, to get that back in balance, we need two new maintenance workers so that we can tip the balance and then we could focus more on the preventative and have that correct ratio. And finally, our third request 
has to do with the valve truck. It, it's the same theme we've been talking about. It's system growth and expansion. Uh, we've had four valve trucks uh, going back over 10 years now, so quite a while. And just through sheer system growth, trying to keep the maintenance program strong and stay with those strong performance metrics, uh, we finally reached a point in time where we need a valve truck. And the, so the valve truck is not just used for maintenance, but anytime there's a, a main break, the valve truck has to get out there and it has to close valves to isolate that, to stop the water from, from gushing out of wherever we're, we had the break um, so our crews can get in there and make that fix. Um, as well as any time a developer has finished their project and they're ready to tie into our system, we need the valve truck and a crew to do test shutdowns and then the actual shutdown so that we can isolate that part of the system so that the developer can quickly tie in and then we can put that part of the system back in service. Um, so that's our third request. And then now we want to bring this home and tie it all together with some high level summaries. So this, pre oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just backing up, looking at the slides, I noticed on the bottom of each slide prior to this final one where we had the summary is um, how it ties into, I assume, our climate action plan, or where is this um, on the very bottom, the green area? That's or it's just the data, our, our data system? It, that, that ties into our core business uh, processes, so part of our performance metric reporting. Okay. So it's just, it ties into a specific metric. Uh, Correct. Performance, uh, performance so measures. So just trying to say, when Chris was saying, okay. this helps us to do a better job of performing at the results of some kind of measurement of, of uh, that they track, that's where you would go oh, find that. Oh, that's where link. the data so if is. council wanted to go find that dashboard, I'm assuming that's where it takes Correct. it to. Okay. okay. It's I just a link to that dashboard. Okay. okay, thank you. But you're also right about the client. So that very bottom footnote with the leaf, that does relate to the climate action plan. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so here we show uh, our performance results in fiscal year 2021, where we did end the year with $83 million in expenditures. That did come in under our adopted budget, which is good news. Our 21-22 budget is, was set at $100.7 million, and we are estimating that we will complete the year under budget at around $97.2 million. This has been uh, quite an accomplishment considering that over the course of the last year, we have operated with as many as 50 vacant positions and we're getting hit hard with all of the price increases for goods and services. So our staff has done a phenomenal job at maintaining the expenditures considering all of the challenges. Bill Seth, I, I think I want to say some of the savings has come because of vacancies, but the vacancies have created a problem for us operationally, Correct. so we're having to, I get, in some ways, it's good to have savings, but not necessarily because you're you losing positions. Right. So we've, you're gonna, we're going to be much more aggressive, and we've made some changes with Chris's leadership on trying to make sure we retain and recruit more staff because we can't operate these plants 24/7 with just one or two people. So right, I was right. going to touch on that. Oh, that sorry. Due to the vacancies, no, that's you're good. Um, we were uh, faced with needing to make some wage adjustments to try to, to retain the existing staff. Um, we lost a lot of staff to the private sector that was ramping up and they do similar work, uh, primarily Intel. Um, and we just couldn't be competitive to retain those folks and additionally to recruit new staff. So we were kind of pushed into a situation where we had to look at that and make those adjustments. Um, it's been successful. I can tell you, as of yesterday, we're down to 24 active recruitments. Uh, we haven't seen a number that low in two plus years. So it's been very successful. Our 22-23 proposed buzz budget is set at 107.6 million. This does include all 10 of the new positions that we discussed earlier in the presentation, as well as the adjustment of the chemist position to a full-time um, included in that is a 5.17% adjustment to the baseline budget to help offset the inflation. And it is accounting for all of those one-time costs that we will have. On the next slide, I'll show you some of the bigger adjustments that we've been challenged with so you can get an idea of where those challenges uh, lie. These are some of our bigger items in our budget. Um, again, our partners uh, in the Val Vista Joint Venture Plant and the 91st Avenue Wastewater Plant, they're experiencing the same cost pressures that we are. 
Uh, they have had to make adjustments to retain and recruit employees, as well as the added costs on goods and services and commodities. So at Val Vista, unfortunately, we're looking at about a $1.1 million increase over last year. Our water chemicals, the uh, uh, water quality coming into our water treatment plants remains good. Uh, the forecast for the next year is saying that it should remain that way. So we believe that we will actually, even though we're seeing cost increases, that we will actually use a little bit less chemicals, so we see a little bit of a reduction. On the water electric, it's going up slightly. Uh, we know we're facing rate increases from both SRP and the city side, but we've taken a look at our pumping strategy and we're gonna make a change to our pumping strategy and we will maximize those off-peak rates. So it minimizes the impact. Obviously, the big item in our budget is the water purchases. Um, as of when we calculated these numbers, we're looking at a $1.18 million increase. Uh, the biggest portion of that is the CAP side. Um, that is based on the current tier one shortage situation. So if CAP begins to increase those shortages, those rates will continue to go up. And so we keep a real close eye on that one. The 91st Avenue plant, again, they're facing the same cost pressures. We're seeing a slight increase out there. Fortunately there, we have five partners to share that pain, whereas Val Vista, there's only two of us. <laughs> the wastewater chemicals, uh, we have seen the cost increases are really hitting us hard on this side. The inbound flow on the wastewater side, the, the flows are a little more difficult for us to treat. Um, so we're using additional chemical coupled with the cost increase, so we need some additional money. Uh, because of some of the uh, efficiency improvement projects at our wastewater plants, we actually are gonna be able to reduce our electric budget slightly. So that's the good news. Uh, the large number on the Greenfield plant, that is primarily driven by that in the current fiscal year, we had a lot of one-time dollar funding to complete some rehabilitation and replacements. We don't have that in the 22-23 fiscal year. So that is what we have. If you have any questions. Any additional questions? Vice Mayor. Since water is such a big subject for us as living in the desert, um, what is our assured water supply as far as our portfolio, our you know, projections as a city that we can say we're great. I don't know if we do it as a city. You know, we're good for 10 years. We're good for 20 years. We have to say 100. We have to say 100. We have a plan for 100 years. Yeah, that's our requirement for us to be able to issue permits. Okay. And so, yeah, that's where we're at. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, well, my takeaway from this is it's it's good to be a water treatment engineer right now, right? It's uh, yeah. it's interesting that you're excited that you only have 24 openings and we're adding 10 more. So I'm glad that that, that doesn't bother you. To me, that seems like a lot of openings. And uh, if you know, if you've got a, a nephew in, you know, Missouri that's a water treatment engineer, call him. And water call treatment him. operators, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Water treatment operators, if you know somebody, send them our yeah. way. Uh, the entire valley is really struggling. We're all competing for the same talent pool, especially for the operator twos. Yeah. So there is a lot but, of opportunity Mayor, in the valley. Seth or Chris, talk a little bit about aren't we aren't we using a, kind of a journeyman internship program mm -hmm. also to kind of start out early in their careers? Talk about we that are. We have we implemented a uh, intern program probably five or six years ago, and so we are essentially building our own. Um, it's been a very successful program. Uh, uh, almost too successful. We've actually had a few people that we spent the time, trained them, groomed them, and they quickly got snatched up by another Utah, uh, city. Um, so, you know, it's a good thing. We look at it as a good thing. But to really fill the bulk of those vacant positions that we had over the last year and a half, it came through our intern program. Um, I know some of you have done a tour out there. I think you guys uh, probably encountered Adam at the Signal View plant. Adam is one of our big success stories. He came on through the intern program, he has worked his way up, and he is the loan treatment process specialist for both plants. Seth, where do they get their, where, where are they getting the, their certification, their um, schooling? Is that coming out of? 
which community are we working at community college or what we community? we do have a partnership with uh, Maricopa Community Colleges right. they've got a water environmental right. uh, technology I think program so we do try to recruit from that um, but we wish we got a few more out of that program but we actually get people who have recently graduated with some kind of uh, environmental related degree and they actually become interested in getting into this so it, it's really quite an interesting mix of folks that we do attract. Could, could we work with EVIT, um, perhaps, with the, in conjunction with the rest of the East Valley cities to see if they can start up hmm. uh, an operation, you can have that conversation, uh, technician yeah, sure. type well, Sure. There's going to be, with all the uh, semiconductor plants coming on, there's going to be a, that's a career path. Well, for, uh, and you look at water in general in Arizona, you sure. know, it, everybody's going to need operators mm -hmm. and you know if there's an opportunity to to take those those folks that don't want to go to college but otherwise want to learn a skill i mean this is a, sure. a an amazing program that they, they could stand up that would help all the east valley cities and probably west valley as well yep all right well thank you gentlemen all right thank you uh we're making progress uh <laughs> We still have uh, the, the Energy Resources Department. Is everybody okay? Need a quick break? You want to stand up for a second, or what do you think you'd go, keep going? You know, why don't we reconvene it? Let, let, let's go ahead. <clears throat> uh, and and let, let's meet back here at 925. Let's take the, uh, stretch our legs and and come. We'll reconvene at 925. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I think we're ready to get rolling again. Gentlemen, thank you. The next uh, item on our agenda, item 2B, is a presentation on Energy Resources Department budget. Gentlemen, take it away. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, with me today is Tony Kadorn, who's our Energy Resources Program Manager. Uh, to my right is John Petroff, our Senior Fiscal Analyst. And to his right is Kyle Nicholson, who's our Electric System Superintendent. Some new faces. We've had some retirements in the last couple of years through COVID. So. Um, and we also have in the audience Keith Korch, who could help me answer any gas-type questions that come up, and uh, Rich Manzo, who's our CIP uh, manager, and he can handle any uh, questions that John and I can't handle on, on CIP-related projects. So with that, um, I'm Frank McRae. I'm the Energy Resources Director, and I think you all know that we've owned our gas and electric utilities since 1917. So our 131 employees in our department really strive to... Uh, provide superior electric and gas utility services. And when we, when we say superior, what we're meaning is very high levels of safety, reliability, and affordability. Affordability has really become a critical issue. We serve about 17,500 electric customers now. It's growing, of course. And we also serve 72,000 gas customers throughout the city of Mesa, as well as outside the city of Mesa, what we call um, our magma system. Um, our most recent recognition and award from uh, national uh, organizations is the American Public Power Association Certificate of Excellence and Reliability. And while we've had some challenges with reliability uh, towards the end of last year, uh, we've still achieved a very high level of reliability compared to our peers across the nation. So with that, I'm going to turn to um, a, a table that I, I really like this table because it shows how closely aligned what our priorities are, which is safety, reliability, and affordability are, how they align and correlate with what those council <coughs> strategic initiatives and priorities are. So the one area where you see that we don't have any check uh, boxes checked is uh, skilled and talented workforce. Um, but what I will add is, and that's the way it's defined in the, the council's um, uh, strategic initiatives, but what I will say is we've developed uh, internship programs within our department, um, especially for STEM students at local universities. And so we feel like we're helping contribute in a way that doesn't really show up in the, in the definition, the way that the city defines skilled and talented workforce. We're also gonna explain how a couple of these uh, strategic initiatives and priorities closely correlate with our purpose and our priorities, especially as we start getting into some slides that talk about our performance measures. We also uh, encourage our employees to take advantage of the city's tuition reimbursement program. So that goes into that skilled and talented workforce. At one time, we had up to six employees uh, participating in the tuition reimbursement program. And John Pratt recently earned his uh, master's in business administration from 
Benedictine University. Oh, so job, kudos to him. Know, so. That's good. Um, the next uh, initiative that I'm going to talk about is uh, the sustainable economy one. Um, there's two key aspects of this priority that I thought closely aligned with what we try to do, and that's uh, keeping our energy utility rates affordable and building and maintaining and operating a quality infrastructure. So that would be safe and re reliability in our lingo. And that's how we contribute towards uh, MESA achieving this priority. Um, we also strive to continue and keep um, our, our services affordable and make them more affordable if we can. Um, we minimize the amount of our customers' income. That's one of our uh, approaches is to minimize the amount of our customers' income that is spent on energy utility services, making them affordable. We've created programs such as the Summer Energy Assistance Program, which goes to help those low-income customers that struggle with their summer electric bills. Of course, that's when their electric bills increase because their consumption increases because of their use of their air conditioners. So that's to help those customers that struggle in that, in that period of time. We've also developed um, tools for the economic development and industrial development um, teams as well. So we have our uh, rates that allow us to discount our rates for periods of time to use as an attraction tool for different types of uh, businesses, industries. We also have a small business development tool in downtown Mesa where Jeff McVeigh and his team have uh, used that tool oftentimes to help uh, smaller businesses expand and grow. So the safety and uh, reliability of our energy utility systems, the pipes, the wires, the, the poles, the, the valves, et cetera, it plays a vital role in the quality of the infrastructure that's so important to attracting businesses to Mesa and facilitating the growth. Um, the next one I wanted to talk a little bit about was the uh, healthy environment. Um, we, we feel like it's stewardship of the environment has been a really important underlying principle of how we manage uh, your electric and gas utilities. Um, it closely correlates with our priorities and our future plans. And we're really enthusiastic about the prominent role that our department can play in meeting the goals of the Mesa Climate Action Plan. Uh, as I think you've heard me talk about before, renewable resources make up about 20% of our current electric energy supply portfolio and we continue to add to that supply portfolio. We've got now 118 customers that are participating in our customer-owned solar program. That contributes about 1.2 megawatts to our grid. And we also recently executed contracts with a solar provider for the installation of about 800 kW of solar on the ASU building, the ice rink administration building, and the parking canopies that will be built for Mesa City Plaza and 59 North Center. So just those two elements will bring about two megawatts of solar into our grid. Um, we're also continuing to pursue and negotiate agreements for about 20 megawatts of utility scale solar. This would not be within our electric system. It's probably gonna be in the Casa Ground area somewhere where we have transmission available to bring the power into our service area, but also of a magnitude where we can take advantage of those economies of scale. We're also likely to attach energy storage to that type of a contract as well. So an example of our efforts to enhance the energy efficiency was that uh, grant that we were pursuing with the uh, Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation that we talked about earlier this morning. We've also supported the adoption of alternative fuels into the city's uh, fleets. Um, we've collaborated with environmental management and the conversion of their solid waste trucks to compressed natural gas. We're also working very closely with them to find a way to make renewable gas out of some of our, um, our uh, waste processing. We'll also be acquiring five electric vehicles if the budget's approved in the next fiscal year. So how we'll maximize the value of those, we'll put those vehicles in the hands of our employees that drive the most miles. That way we can save the most tons of CO2 by avoiding the use of a, a gasoline internal combustion engine vehicle. So we're also um, helping to identify the enhancements to the electric distribution systems to support the EV charging systems that will be installed, uh, both on city property as well as on private properties. And will be um, those charging stations will be needed, obviously, for the fleet additions to um, the, the electric vehicle fleet additions to our Mesa fleet. Um, one of the other things that's uh, kind of a nuance to what we do is um, natural gas systems, um, we have a very uh, definitive uh, leak survey system, and so 
the leakage of, uh, of natural gas is uh, a potential contributor to global climate change. So we are going to enhance the technologies that we use to survey our system for leaks and to start probably repairing leaks that we would otherwise defer repairing of. So that's a common practice that we don't fix every leak we find. Some leaks are worse than others. The potential consequences of some leaks are worse than others. The worst ones we fix immediately. Others we monitor for extended periods of time until it's time to repair those. We're probably going to start accelerating the pair of those leaks that we might otherwise defer. That'll help us achieve something like a climate action plan. And that helps us try to get to that uh, uh, net zero type of a, a, a goal for our climate action plan. So one of the things we'll talk a little bit about later um, is, is a um, energy system control room. That will make um, uh, uh, achieving many of our climate action plan goals much easier or possible than when they otherwise might not be possible. So I'm going to discuss that later in slide 12. So uh, as previously indicated, our department's top priority is safety and enhancing the safety of our system enhances the safety of the communities we serve. So when we have a power outage and it, and it impairs the ability of a traffic signal, um, we understand that and it, it causes us to be very concerned about the safety of the community because we know some of those traffic signals may not have emergency power backup or the power backup may not last as long as it needs to. So we, we take that responsibility very seriously. One of the ways we measure the safety of our system on the electric side is the time it takes for our personnel to respond to an emergency situation. Um, and we use that for both the electric and gas systems. So the nature of these types of emergencies can range from an interruption of an electrical service from a windstorm or a carpool accident, or it can be related to a dig in by a contractor on our gas system. So the nature of those types of events creates a, a much different challenge for us of how to respond. So the performance measure that we use um, is similar to that used by the police department, the fire medical department. Kyle's going to discuss that um, measure that we use on the electric side. Thank you, Frank. Good morning, Mayor, Council. Um, as previously indicated, the safety of our system is our highest priority. Um, this slide here indicates the electric emergency response time. Um, that's the average time it takes for our electric personnel to respond to an emergency call once the, uh, the call is, is made to our uh, department. One of the measures we use here is to gauge the safety of our electric utility system. Uh, we have established 30 minutes as the maximum time for our staff to respond to an emergency. You can see here for fiscal year 21-22, our average response time was 17.9 minutes. Um, we're well below um, the 30-minute threshold there. Um, minimizing our response to electrical uh, emergencies can also improve our reliability of service as well uh, as will be discussed on slide number six. Okay, so I'll handle the uh, gas emergency response time. Um, and again, it's uh, our safety measure. Um, we use the average time it takes to respond to emergency calls to gauge our performance. Um, and, and what we've done is we do a little bit differently than what we do just an average response time. So what we're looking at is very similar to what police and fire have started using, which is what percentage of our responses exceed 30 minutes. So we get thousands of calls a year on the gas side. Um, and so using that data to come up and use just an average would not really give us a real clear picture of where we're responding to these emergency calls in a safe manner. We really want to limit that response time to 30 minutes. So we've gone to how many of our calls in terms of percentage exceed that 30 minute response time. So you can see that um, we've got a, a goal of about 9%. Uh, going forward. Last year it was 9.4%. The prior years were 9.4%. We changed it to 9% in July of last year. And you can see we're doing pretty well. We can go to the next slide. Um, we also look at it in terms of a histogram where we separate out in five minute increments how many of our different response events uh, fall into these different categories. And so you can see most of our um, uh, responses are much less than 30 minutes. 
uh, about 3% of our calls exceed that 30 minute time frame. So anytime we get a, a response that exceeds 30 minutes, we dig into what were the circumstances that caused that response to exceed 30 minutes. The, the typical reason is because we've got a service technician that's responding to calls simultaneously or one immediately after the other. So when we face that situation, we make safe, we may not fix, but we make safe one call and then we get to the next call. And we fix that one and then we go back to the initial call to fix the issue there. So that's oftentimes what causes that 30 minute, that second response is what takes us uh, over 30 minutes typically. The other issue is we, we do have that service territory down in magma. And sometimes the traffic flows make it very difficult for us to get to a call down in magma or to get from magma back up to Southeast Mesa. And that causes the uh, time frame to exceed 30 minutes. And sometimes it's, it's the distance and traffic as well as the simultaneous calls. Um, we've used this data over time to significantly alter how we manage our, 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 our resources. Um, a couple of years ago, we added an additional technician to our standby rotation so that instead of one technician responding to all these calls, we added another person to the standby process. So. Frank, do we have um, dedicated crews down in MAGMA that um, their primarily focus is that MAGMA gas system? In, in terms of the emergency response personnel, that's correct. We do have people. We have, we're fortunate to have some people that live in and around the MAGMA area, so those are the people that report to the MAGMA area. We also have times where people might be on vacation or they might be working on a special project where we have to send people back and forth. Do uh, emergency response people, there's quite, a, quite a, a presence down there of staff that live in and around MAGMA so that we can staff it down there. We do have an office down there that we share with the irrigation district down there. Okay, and that was going to be my next question. Do we have all their equipment stuff there to hit trucks, back We We, we do. Um, most of our crews will um, commute from the East Mesa Service Center down to MAGMA, the ones that are doing the new installations or repairs. Uh, most of those are, are traveling down there. We do have a small yard where we keep some materials and do, we do keep some of our construction equipment down there. Okay, thank you. Quick question. Is there a map of magma in your presentation? I mean, for some of the council members, it, it, there is one. It's at the back it's behind the last slide. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Because some of us will go, well, where's magma at? You know, in magma, so. Very hot do, you, do you want us to show you that real quick? I think we can. Do, so. They can just go, go and keep yeah. going. We, we can yeah. find it, okay. continue on, okay. thank you. All right. So the next slide we'll talk about is uh, electric reliability. And so um, the way we measure uh, reliability is using an industry standard indice. Um, it was uh, developed by the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers in the 60s, as I recall. Um, and it's called the System Average Interruption Duration Index. You've got to leave it to electrical engineers to come up with that type of, a, of a acronym. Um, so what it measures is, based upon historical data, what would our customers expect to experience in terms of an outage on an ongoing basis? So the average customer. So it, it's, a, it's a very similar type of calculation to what Chris explained for the water. Um, and so we, we take the number of customers that are impacted by an outage and the duration of their outage and we massage that into an indice that says, uh, on average, here's the amount of interruption time that any customer might experience on our system. So you can see how we've set that target. Now, we look at this one on a cumulative basis rather than on a monthly basis. So you can see that in <coughs> January and February, we typically forecast that we have very minimal outages. The outages increase sequentially until we get into the the May-June timeframe when the winds pick up and we start having wind and weather-related outages. Most of our interruptions and services are attributable to weather and animals. So we have a lot of um, bird-related outages, um, uh, four-legged critter outages, as well as the, uh, the vegetation. So as you can see, that, that accumulation of outages times increases until we get into December. 
So uh, you can see in 2020 uh, that our, our performance <coughs> was quite good. Um, we didn't experience a large number of outages in the uh, summertime. Um, we do a lot of different things to try and minimize our exposure to those outages. And sometimes we're lucky enough where the weather is pretty mild and we don't have a lot of monsoon storms. Oftentimes, though, we'll have an equipment failure. Um, and that's part of what you see those spikes in last year in the, um, the, the June, July time frame. And then uh, in December, we actually had a human error that caused a dramatic increase in that spike there. And so we'll talk a little bit more about how we plan to remedy uh, preventing that human um, caused error. So one of the things I will say is the, the best way for us to um, keep this index down is to prevent the outage in the first place. Uh, once an outage happens, it's that emergency response time that really helps us keep that outage down. The time it takes to replace a fuse, um, we've made that about as efficient as possible. Um, the, the amount of time that it takes to respond to the outage and the um, prevention of the outage is our best way of keeping this, uh, this SADI index down as low as possible. And of course, also avoiding any type of um, human error. So one of the things we do to, to minimize our equipment failures or getting to the point of um, catastrophic is we do a lot of inspections. So Mayor, at our, our uh, youth um, uh, council meetings, we love to show how we use our infrared cameras to inspect our electrical equipment. So we can use those cameras to identify a piece of equipment that's showing uh, exorbitantly high or inordinately high temperatures. Those inordinately high temperatures are often a precursor to a catastrophic failure. So if we can do a planned replacement of that transformer or that switch or that fuse bank, as opposed to waiting for it to catastrophically fail, we can bring down our SADI dramatically. So we also keep track of the geographical areas and the customers that have experienced high outages, uh, high interruption events. And so we'll target tree trimming possibly for that area because some areas the vegetation grows much faster than it does other in other areas. And so we will target that area for an accelerated tree trimming schedule. Um, we've talked about a little bit about that in the Spillsbury. Um, and we've uh, also put up bird guards, et cetera, for uh, prevention as well. So that. Um, let's go to uh, the frequency of outages. So this is a little bit of a different index. Um, it's the system average interruption frequency index. So this is a measure of uh, not so much the duration of the outages. Um, we do do that calculation for gas, but what's most useful for us on the gas side is the frequency. How frequent can a um, customer expect to have their gas service interrupted? Because gas is typically below ground, we don't have the, the number of outages that we do on the uh, gas, on the electric side, excuse me. So you can see there we had a couple of spikes. And it, it's a, it was, as we were going through the data, what jumped out to me was how we can have very few customers be impacted by an outage. But once that outage duration started increasing, it made uh, these, this indices jump. So in October of 18, um, that was caused by a contractor dig-in uh, in and around our magma area. It interrupted service to 39 customers for approximately seven hours. Now, uh, as Councilmember Thompson knows, uh, the, the biggest challenge to uh, preventing dig-ins is from contractors not abiding by the blue stake marks, the blue stake laws, uh, digging safely, using safe practices, and uh, making the call for the digs the marks uh, to begin with. So in that instance, it was, uh, it was an unsafe dig on the part of the contractor. Frank, are we recovering our costs um, on those? Um, we, we do account for those costs, um, especially when there's overtime incurred, because that's really when the costs start accumulating. And we do um, file claims with the contractor. I'm not sure how successful we are on the recovery of those costs. I can look into that for you. Um, the spike in August 19 was also in magma. 
Um, it was similarly caused by a contractor dig in. Um, in that instant, this was a four inch gas main and that interrupted service to 72 customers for 14 hours. So you can see the relative spike in the index. So if there's no questions on um, our safety, reliability, performance measures, indices, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony Gadorn and have him talk about our energy supply uh, efforts. Good morning, uh, Mayor Council. So. Um, what you'll see are cumulative graphs of our gas and electric supply costs. This is electric um, across the past three fiscal years. Um, so uh, when we came to you in June 2021, uh, we noted that there was a very large spike in electric uh, supply prices that we were seeing. And um, when we put that in front of you, we had an estimate that uh, the 2021 uh, fiscal year would end around $30 million in the 22 uh, 21 22 fiscal year would end somewhere between 40 and 60 million dollars. Well, um, happy to report that uh, we've stayed substantially below those numbers. Um, we ended or, or are projected to end uh, this fiscal year at uh, closer, closer to 30 million dollars rather than that 40 to 60. And last fiscal year we ended uh, closer to 15 million dollars or 16 million dollars instead of that 30. So, um, we were very conservative with those estimates and uh, we've really been working hard to lock in prices and uh, capture deals where we can. So um, moving forward uh, into fiscal year 22-23, we're looking closer to $22 million, so down $8 million from this year. And uh, continuing to chip away at that as best we can. So supporting that effort, as Frank mentioned, we'll have 800 kilowatts of solar in downtown Mesa. Um, 1.1 to 1.2 kilowatts of customer-owned solar. So that's, so that's customers with net metering who are generating both their own power and contributing power to the uh, utility. Uh, we're working on the three megawatt, three to four megawatt microgrid at the PD campus, uh, working on inexpensive utility scale solar, uh, internal generation. And so with uh, the market remaining tight and pressure on uh, hydroelectric supplies, we're really working to continue to diversify our electric supply portfolio. I'm on the sorry, gas on, side. On that topic before yeah. you, I, I know this last year we've used a substantial amount of COVID relief money to cushion the, uh, you know, the impact of that, that catastrophic rate or uh, cost of uh, wholesale electricity. Uh, and I, I appreciate all you're doing to increase our electric generation capacity with solar and gas, and that, that's, uh, that's wonderful, but I can't imagine that's, I mean, at some point we're gonna run out. What, what are we gonna do a year or two from now? It, I guess it, it's entirely dependent on what the wholesale cost of electricity looks like, right? But it, assuming it doesn't dramatically decrease, like it dramatically increased, are, we, are our electric cu customers gonna be paying you know, above market rates for their, for their electricity. Well, Mayor, they're not gonna be paying above market because we're only passing I mean, the market. By market, I mean compared to SRP. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the assistance that we're providing was for that specific period of time where we had that tremendous spike. And we are um, using ARPA dollars to reimburse, or not reimburse, not the right word, offset yes. those offset. costs offset. Um, over a two year period. So that continues today. Um, I think we set aside $20 million I think today we're somewhere around six, seven million dollars that's already been dispersed to Mesa Electric customers um, to offset that specific spike, and it will continue for the next year, I guess, year and a half. So um, we can evaluate at the end of that and see where our um, costs are relative to SRP or others. But at least for now, the plan is in place, and we're executing that plan to offset um, th that spike that they occurred really as a result of a natural causes, right? Wasn't that the one that caused because of the freeze and some other things too? Yeah, it, it's really the Western regional markets. And, and so while we're um, a lot more at risk than SRP was of the spikes in the wholesale markets because we were, um, other than our 20% um, renewable contracts for the hydro, we were on the market for the other 80% of our energy supplies. Um, SRP, heavily relies upon the market, but not as much as we do. But they also rely upon natural gas for a lot of their generation as well. So natural gas prices have 
also increased. And it, it wasn't just one issue. I wish we could say it was the, the Texas freeze because then we just got a winterize plants and winterize natural gas systems and, and we should be able to, to minimize our risk. But it's things like plants being retired across the 11 western states. It's the coal plants that have been retired. It, it's the, the fires in California that shaded the solar panels that California's become so heavily dependent upon to supply their electrical requirements. We went from them overproducing solar several years ago and paying us to take the excess solar generation to now where that solar what didn't show up because of the cloud cover and the smoke cover and the retirements hit as well um, and, and demand started picking up and so the, the market. So the, the prices that we faced at the peak a couple years ago was in the $250 per megawatt hour range and that and, and above up to at certain hours, $9,000 per megawatt hour? Yeah, around $3,000, yeah. $3,000 per megawatt hour. Um, and this uh, year, the, the, the prices that we paid were in the 150 yes. to 180 range. So they've already come down some. They're still much higher than what they were five years ago. Um, but SRP is also in that same market trying to find ways to get below $150 per megawatt hour supplies. Those supplies historically were in the $50 to $80 megawatt hour range and we rely upon a substantial amount of that market supplied power to meet our customers requirements so that's why we're coming forward with the microgrid that that's a small size generator in the big scheme of things but if we can use that as a template for multiple other microgrids then it's going to be a short-term issue where our costs are high at relative and our rates are rel high relative to SRP but SRP also has upward pressure on their rates as well. Re remember that before we entered into this period of time, our residential rates were about 20% less than SRPs. And unfortunately, we had that heavy exposure to the market where it caused our rates, but for the um, ARPA money, to uh, keep our rates comparable with SRP. And I can tell you, uh, I am very, very humbled that the city manager and the council found a way to offset those increased costs on our customers. That, that's probably the most humbling thing I've ever experienced in my, my career. So it's motivated us to do as many creative things as we can to go out and find ways to mitigate the exposure that we have in the future. Those long-term agreements with utility scale solar, so we're not dealing with 800 kW rooftop type solar within our service area on city buildings. We're dealing with tens and 20 megawatts of solar. But we also have to back that up with batteries because when solar energy is produced, it doesn't align up hour-wise with when our customers and the city requires electricity for air conditioning. So we have to do things like batteries and do things like microgrid generation to kind of balance and make sure that that solar energy gets to be used for our customers when it's most important, most critical. We also have proposals that we're looking at to build internal generation like what SRP is doing with their, um, their aero derivative turbines. Now, we probably won't be using aero derivative turbines. We're probably going to be using internal combustion engines, but it's a very similar concept and planning philosophy of bringing that generation in internal into our system and using it so we insulate ourselves from the market forces outside. We actually identified this in our 2000 and 18 integrated resource plan. We just thought we had more time before the reserve margins and the market conditions cratered on us and caused those prices to spike. Great. Well, I, I appreciate that, and, and I, I absolutely endorse the subsidies that we're using right now, but I, I just share your concern with what happens a year or two from now when that federal uh, safety net isn't there. How are we going to, are we going to be competitive? Hopefully the prices will stabilize. Yeah. Yeah, Thank and we, <clears throat> when, when we first went through this exercise, we kind of settled between us and budget on a number that about $20 million of annual portfolio costs on the electric side will give us parity with SRP. So coming to the end of this year, we're looking at around $29 million. So there's, there's that $9 million delta that we're hoping is going to be supported by ARPA funds. And then our best estimate for next fiscal year, so 22-23, is only $22 million. So um, 
you know, we foresee that 20 million as SRP's prices go up, um, you know, maybe as that comes up a little bit, we're able to reduce costs. Um, we think that ARPA funding will be able to be stretched. The bridge is better. Mm -hmm. The bridge is going to be longer, yeah. Great, thank you. Mr. Thompson. I have a 10 o'clock or another meeting I have to get to, um, but I just wanted before I left to say thank you for Frank and you, all of you guys, uh, not only for your outstanding safety record, because um, I don't think people realize uh, the environment that you guys and your staff work in. Uh, so um, thank you for your safety record and for always thinking outside the box when it comes to protecting our community uh, from the higher rates and so forth. And um, Always enjoy our conversations, Frank. So thank you, guys. Frank, why don't we get to your enhancements? Okay, we, we, we go there. Okay. Uh, I, I'll, I'll spend just a couple of minutes on each slide. So um, we've got two areas of uh, budget enhancement requests. One is to supplement our existing utility locator staff. So one of the things that's not really well known is that this team is the frontline protector of the city's underground uh, infrastructure and assets. So uh, this group um, responds to the blue stake request. We were given uh, two working days to identify up to 10 different pieces of underground infrastructure across the city when somebody wants to come in and excavate. So that's... Um, I'm gonna to have to re re resort to my list. So it's the chilled water system in downtown, the electric system downtown, uh, the gas utility system across the city, uh, the IT department's communications fiber systems, the reclaimed water system, the storm drain system, the street lights, the traffic signals, including the fiber optic network for the intelligent transportation system, water and wastewater sewer system. So, um, talk about a Rubik's Cube. Um, this is a Rubik's Cube out in the middle of the intersections with traffic was in Bayou. Um, so again, the, the federal regulations require us to identify and mark with visible paint or, or stakes um, that infrastructure so that people can safely excavate. Now, one of the new technologies or, or practices for uh, installing underground infrastructure is boring. So instead of an open trench, they have a big underground drill bit that drills through the earth. And if not done properly, as it gets near and crosses over or under or into our underground infrastructure, it can cause serious damage. And without somebody on site watching and monitoring that boring process, we can have a lot of damage done to our underground infrastructure. So in the last couple of years, the linear feet of boring monitoring that we've had to undertake has risen by 55%. So that shows how much this type of construction practice is being used and how much of the development activity is relying upon it. So um, that's the, uh, the lead locator. The other one is just a matter of, we're not showing any um, problems or downward trends with the accuracy or our damage prevention program, but we are hearing from our employees through the surveys, but the workload, the amount of overtime that they're carrying from week to week to month to month to year to year is getting uh, overwhelming and we need to supplement the staff. So you can look at the number of locating tickets. So a ticket is a request to locate each different piece of our underground infrastructure at the time when the blue stake ticket is requested. Um, so the next one is for a uh, control room. So there's a CIP project for um, converting our old utilities control center over on um, uh, 6th Street into a energy control room. Right now it's used as a, an emergency operations center for the um, gas and electric uh, utilities and also parks and rec and solid waste use it for some purposes. Um, so we're going to convert that into a dedicated energy control room. Right now we have a uh, irregularly manned, um, very small, uh, undersized control room within the utilities control center. Um, our electric and our gas systems are not continuously monitored or operated. Uh, on the electric side, we divert our substation electricians and our electric meter foremen from their normal jobs, which are very, very technically demanding and sometimes physically demanding and we bring them into the control room. So that outage that we had in December, uh, the human error was caused by one of those 
uh, sub uh, field professionals coming into the control room, performing the switching process. There was an error made, and that's what caused that outage. So what we've shown here in this slide is if we had not had that human error caused outage, our SADI index for 2021 would have been according to the red line rather than the blue line. So while I'm not going to guarantee that our control room personnel won't have similar human errors, I am confident that it will be avoided. I am confident that they will be focused and dedicated to ensuring that safety and reliability of our system in ways that the way we currently staff that control room, we can't do it. Can't, can't make that assurance. So this control room will also uh, do a lot of other things other than just monitoring and controlling the electric gas systems. We'll put in their hands the responsibilities to maximize the benefits of things like solar energy and energy storage. They'll look at when uh, the time is right, when fuel prices are right, and when the market prices are high of when to, to operate those uh, P PD microgenerators up to 5,000 hours a year. They'll be the people that are making the real-time decisions of when to uh, operate the microgrid and when to operate the generators within the microgrid. They'll also be doing things like um, we, we oftentimes find ourselves remarketing and reselling some of our uh, services for interstate transportation or trans transmission on the electric side. Um, so we remarket and resell those. We're going to expand um, the amount of time that we spend on analyzing when we have that excess service or that excess capacity and remarket and reselling. So we think we're going to generate, um, all told, about a million dollars of new benefit to the, the city of Mesa's electric and gas utilities on an annual basis with the control room. And, and we think it'll be very helpful for also a lot of other climate action plan measures. But one of the things that we're uh, most excited about is, is bringing that renewable gas uh, into our gas system. But there is a requirement to make sure that the, that the gas is cleaned up to the standards. We want to make sure that there's not corrosive uh, elements uh, remaining in the gas that comes from the gas cleanup plant, and we want to make sure it doesn't have uh, higher levels of moisture, water, or carbon dioxide than what we're allowed to put in our gas pipeline. So with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Council, any questions for these gentlemen before we conclude? All right, thank you. Uh, I guess that concludes uh, these agenda items related to our, uh, our budget hearings. Um, <coughs> next item on our agenda is to acknowledge receipt of various minutes. Is there a motion to that effect? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Vice Mayor, seconded by Ms. Spilsbury. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That passes with the three, four, five members that are here. Uh, next item is uh, current events and conferences attended. I know you've been busy. Council, who would like to share? Mr. Freeman. I'll, I'll jump in. Thank you, Mayor. I, I did a tour of the uh, uh, police dispatch center yesterday and talked to the Slory person there, Slory, and they uh, were able to divert 321 police calls last month. So I thought that was really awesome. And then we talked to some of the mechanics there. So when I say about the mechanics of how it operates, so it was very informative and I learned a lot. I'd also like to just announce uh, a longtime Mesa resident's death. Kevin Rogers died yesterday. He was uh, president of Maricopa and Arizona Farm Bureau, as well as executive director of Arizona Cotton Growers, longtime farmer. He's been in our council meetings sometimes in the past, talking about when I, we had our farms in uh, Pinell County. But his death was unexpected and uh, he's been a great asset to a lot of people in Arizona. So he, his influence will be missed. So thank you. Uh, yes, I hosted a Farm Bureau breakfast at the farm, and many, all of you were there, so I appreciate that, and had a great turnout with the supervisor, uh, what's his name? Calvin. <laughs> I was seeing if Anna was here. No. She is. <laughs> she doesn't know me anymore either. Yeah. <laughs> totally absent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and, and Supervisor Galvin did a great job. It was it was a, a good uh, introduction for him to the community. Yeah. Uh, who else? Vice Mayor? I'll try to be real quick. 
Um, of course, Saturday was Celebrate Mesa, a great turnout, so much fun. I really, especially all the city departments were there doing great things, but the most cool for me was the Hispanic Network or the part of, of, of um, the city doing that because they had the Encanto character, so I was the coolest <laughs> grandma ever um, to have my picture with the Encanto character. Um, also, on Saturday night, uh, the mayor and I attended the First Presbyterian Church 75th anniversary celebration. Thank you to Joe Wilson for including us, and it's been, um, their history has been part of Mesa's history. Of course, they are located in the downtown area, so it was very interesting, and we highly regard them. Um, a few other things, but that's it. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I'll just echo what you said. That the I was blown away by how beautiful the uh, the worship building was for First Presbyterian Church. If you haven't been inside uh, and you're looking for a place to worship this Sunday, it, it, this is amazing, a pipe organ, and uh, I, just, I can't, can't believe I hadn't been there before. I was uh, very impressed. Also, uh, Celebrate Mesa, I had the, the same experience that I think all of you did. I, I remember being there, looking around, thinking, this really is the best day of the year for a lot of the, the families that, that were there. So. Uh, congratulations to Parks and Rec and everyone involved in that. I thought it was really uh, an amazing event, and, and Pioneer Park has never looked so good. It was just fun to see it totally activated uh, in such a wonderful way. Um, yesterday, some of us met with uh, Arizona State Housing Director uh, Tom Simplot. I had a very productive meeting, and uh, it was fun to see. I appreciated his willingness to come to Mesa and, and work with us on, on some of those issues. And then also, uh, I think it was yesterday, I was pleased to welcome the Arizona Housing Coalition Conference to Mesa. This was several hundred people in our convention center all talking about uh, these are professionals in local government on housing and homelessness, and, and uh, they were very complimentary and appreciated what we're doing, and uh, that was, that was uh, I just appreciated the opportunity to do that. Um, that concludes current events. Mr. Brady, what does our schedule of future meetings look like? Thank you, Mayor. Just a reminder, Monday will continue uh, discussions related to the budget. Um, at 4.30, we'll hear from our environmental management and sustainability group. That will also include um, the proposal for our implementation of, um, for this year, of uh, the climate action plan. That'll be included in that presentation. Great. Thank you. If there's nothing else, is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you, Mr. Reddy. I second by Ms. Uh, did you know that you made that motion? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Billsbury, for seconding that. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned.